The 9,460th meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for, for this meeting is the situation concerning Western Sahara. The agenda is adopted. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to draw the attention of council members to document S slash 2023 slash 729, the report of the Secretary General on the situation concerning Western Sahara. Members of the council have before them document S slash 2023 slash 802, the text of a draft resolution submitted by the United States of America. The Council is ready to proceed to the vote on the draft resolution before it. I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2023-802 please raise their hand. Those against? Abstentions? The result of the voting is as follows. 13 votes in favor, no votes against, two abstentions. The draft resolution has been adopted as resolution 2703-2023. Speaking. Who's speaking? Yeah. And I'll give the floor to those members of the council who wish to make statements after the vote. And I give the floor to the representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. The United States is pleased to see the council reaffirm its support for personal envoy de Mistura and for Munuso, led by SRSG Ivanko, with the adoption of this resolution. Today, this council sent a clear message that we must intensify efforts to advance an enduring and dignified resolution for Western Sahara without further delay. Although this resolution received widespread support, we regret that this council was not unanimous in renewing this mandate as unity greatly enhances UN efforts to achieve peace. Colleagues, the United States strongly supports personal envoy de Mistura and his efforts to advance the political process. In adopting this resolution, members of the council underscored the urgent need for a successful political process. We again call on all parties to engage with the personal envoy in good faith and to work toward a sustainable political solution. A political solution is critical to promoting a peaceful and prosperous future for the people of Western Sahara and the region. And the United States continues to view Morocco's autonomy plan as serious, credible, realistic, and one potential approach to satisfying these aspirations. By renewing this mandate, this council has also affirmed the critical role of MINUSO, which works to de-escalate tensions, monitor and report on the situation on the ground and foster the conditions for the political process to advance. We welcome the progress made by MINUSO in the resupply of its team sites to sustain these crucial, crucial operations. The continuation of safe and regular resupply operations and continued respect for Minuso's freedom of movement are vital. Colleagues, we, we remain deeply concerned by the humanitarian conditions in Tindouf, the poor living standards, threats to food security, and lack of access to basic services require a collective response. The United States is the largest donor to this humanitarian response is committed to doing our part, but we must all step up. People across Western Sahara and the region are counting on us. Today was a positive step 
but we must continue to push progress forward. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Mozambique. Mr. President, Mozambique thanks the Peñode for the efforts. We wish to express our strong support for the work of the personal envoy of the Secretary General for Western Sahara, Mr. Stefan Mistura. In the same vein, we reiterate our support for the work of the United Nations Mission for a referendum in West Sierra, Minusma, Minus, Minus, Min, Minusu. Mr. President, Mozambique has approached the consultation process leading to the drafting of this resolution in an open and constructive manner, fully conscious and aware of the mandate of Minusu as adopted by this council. We reiterate, we therefore express our readiness to engage in negotiating process in good faith with the legitimate purpose of assisting Minursu to return to its core objectives of implementing a referendum for self autodeterminations of the people of Western Sahara as provided by Resolution 690. 1991 and subsequent decisions by this very chamber. It is our conviction that the resolution just adopted, it is a current form, will not assist the parties in achieving a just, lasting, and mutually accepted political solution as originally intended. To the contrary, it holds a gradual shift away from the mandate. It only postpones uh, addressing core issues that need to be deal with. We support all efforts aimed at just, lasting, and mutually acceptable political solutions that will provide for the self-determinations of people of Western Sahara in accordance with Security Council Resolutions 69, 74, 24, 14, 24, 68, 24, 94, 25, 48, 26, 02, and 26, 54. Our position is anchored in the chamber in the Charter of the United Nations, which holds that all peoples shall have a uni uh, un should have unquestionable and inalienable right to self-determination. In this principle, was further exposed by General Assembly Resolution 1514 of 1960. As a country that was born from the hard exercising of his very right for our, the, ourselves, we hold this to be not only moral right, but also a right policy with a strong legal basis. We reaffirm our commitment to making effort, every effort to help the parties to find a just, lasting, and mutual acceptable political solution based on compromise. But this has to be based on genuine efforts and with respect to every member constructive proposal. proposal. We reiterate our call to the parts to engage in a good faith with the Secretary General's personal envoy to achieve the long delay exercise of its right to self-determination by the people of Western Sahara. I thank you. I thank the representative of Mozambique for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of the Russian Federation. 
Спасибо, господин. Thank you, Mr. President. The Russian Federation abstained on the draft resolution of the Security Council prepared by the USA, extending the mandate of the UN mission for the referendum in Western Sahara, because not a single one of our principled and properly substantiated comments, including those of a compromised nature, which we have expressed to the American authors of several years now, were taken into account. None of them were taken into account. For that reason, the resolution presented today does not reflect the real situation on the ground that has taken shape in the Western Sahara settlement process and will hardly do anything to support the efforts of the personal envoy of the Secretary General, Stefan de Mistura, to resume direct negotiating process between Morocco and the Polisario Front in order to achieve a mutually acceptable solution. Mr. President, since 2018, Resolutions extending Minoso's mandate have been amended in ways that, as we see it, do harm to the impartial and unbiased approach to the problem of Western Sahara. There is vague wording emerging, which raises questions. Wording that determines the direct parties to the conflict and the Western Sahara settlement process. The many references to the no longer relevant round table format are inappropriate as we see it. This format limits the mediating work of the personal envoy. We did not agree with this approach in the past and we cannot support it today. Therefore, we would once again like to confirm our consistent position on the Western Sahara settlement process. We are in favor of a balanced and unbiased stance. We support the efforts of the personal envoy to organize direct negotiations between Morocco and the Polisario Front. In that way, including as a permanent member of the Security Council and a member of the Group of Friends of Western Sahara, we continue our active contacts with all those interested parties. We are working with the Moroccans, the Polisario, the Algerians, and the Mauritanians. We call on all parties to refrain from unilateral actions which could complicate, complicate a resumption of a focused political dialogue. The ultimate formula for a settlement must be based on mutually ac acceptable solutions which would facilitate a just political settlement of the situation surrounding Western Sahara that suits the Moroccans and also the Polisario, and which stipulates self-determination for the people of Western Sahara within procedures that correspond to the principles and purposes of the UN Charter. In conclusion, we would like to underscore that our position today reflects exclusively our assessment of the um, unscrupulous work of the pen holders on the draft uh, that was presented today. Once again, uh, our very serious doubts over the impartial action uh, by the pen holders of the country subject to the Security Council, uh, uh, the fulfilling of those obligations, our uh, serious doubts are being borne out. At the same time, we consistently support the UN mission in Western Sahara, which plays a key stabilizing role to create conducive conditions on the ground for the resumption of dialogue between Morocco and the Polisario Front, and for advancing the peace process, and also the head of the mission, Alexander Ivanko. Thank you for your attention. I thank the representative of the Russian Federation for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, over the years, Minoso has diligently fulfilled its council mandate and made positive contributions to maintaining stability in Western Sahara and promoting a political settlement. The resolution just adopted shows the council's determination to support a mission in the performance of its duties and to resolve politically the question of Western Sahara. China is pleased to see the positive progress made on Minoso's logistical support and hopes that relevant parties will continue to strengthen communication and cooperation with the mission in accordance with Council resolutions to enable the mission to deliver on its mandate. China's position on the question of Western Sahara is consistent and clear. China supports a just and a lasting solution acceptable to all parties reached through consultations among parties as equals on the basis of the res relevant council resolutions. China supports the personal envoy of SG 
in continuing to step up mediation efforts to further progress in the political process on the basis of an in-depth understanding of the concerns of the parties. It is China's hope that future council discussions on the resolutions on municipal mandate can reflect the latest changes of the situation. We also hope that a pen holder can facilitate full consultation over the council to garner broader consensus. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of China for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of France. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, France welcomes the adoption of the resolution which renews the mandate of MINUSO for one year. First and foremost, I wish to reiterate France's full support for the efforts of the personal envoy of the Secretary General. His recent visit to the region and the consultations that he led were a positive development. I also hail the work of Minuso that plays a key role in stabilizing the region and contributes to creating the conditions necessary for a resumption of the political process. We also welcome the resumption of resupply operations of Minuso monitoring sites to the east of the berm in September, a lasting resumption however, remains necessary in order to guarantee regular resupply. It's also essential to guarantee the freedom of movement of Minoso. France recalls its concern regarding ceasefire violations. We call for the, those responsible for these violations to fully implement the ceasefire agreement in order to facilitate the continuation of the political process. Mr. President, France defends a just, lasting and mutually acceptable political solution in accordance with Security Council resolutions. I recall the historic, clear, clear and constant support of France for the Moroccan autonomy plan. That plan has been on the table since 2007. It is now time to move forward with it. In this vein, France encourages all parties to commit to finding a practicable, realistic, enduring solution based on compromise. We support the efforts of the personal envoy in order to ensure a resumption of the round tables. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank the representative of France for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President. We voted in favor of the one-year renewal of the Minoso mandate. This vote expresses my country's support for the political process, aiming to achieve a political solution which is practicable and realistic, feasible and lasting based on compromise, a solution that is to the situation in the Western Sahara. As we indicated during negotiations, this is a balanced resolution which takes account of the expectations of all parties. It will make it possible to support the efforts of the personal envoy, Stefan de Mistura, in order to allow the resumption of the political process between the various parties. This diplomatic momentum ushered in by the personal envoy must be built upon because the resumption of the roundtable process with all key players is important. We also support the Moroccan Autonomy Plan, which presents credible horizons, reassuring perspectives, which will make it possible not only to put an end to the current state of gridlock, but also to reach a political solution which is just lasting and mutually acceptable. Finally, we encourage the Kingdom of Morocco to continue its efforts in order to preserve the ceasefire and to strengthen its cooperation with MINUSO. We call upon all other parties to do the same thing to, in the interest of security and stability throughout the region. I thank you. I thank the representative of Gabon for their statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of the United Arab Emirates. Sayyid Rais. Mr. President, at the outset, we welcome the adoption of today's resolution that renews the mandate of MENUSO for an additional year. We thank the United States, the pen holder, and the members of the Security Council for positively engaging during the consultation process. The UAE voted in favor of this resolution because it has a balanced, comprehensive text, and it takes into account the important developments that took place since last year, including the informal consultations that took place between the personal envoy, Mr. Stefan Di Mistura. Today's resolution shows the support of the Council to MINURSO and the efforts of the Special Envoy in order to make progress in the political process that is facilitated by the UN. 
as this is the last meeting scheduled for this issue during our mandate at the Security Council, I would like to reaffirm the following three points. One, we must continue to support the efforts of the Special Envoy in order to pave the way for a relaunch of negotiations. We believe that the roundtable format with the participation of all parties will help break the political impasse. We stress in this regard that the autonomy initiative provided by the Kingdom of Morocco and that was described or mentioned by UN Security Council resolutions as serious and legitimate, this is the only way to reach a last, durable and pragmatic political solution that is mutually acceptable. Second, enabling MINURSO to resupply its sites in a sustainable manner and not just on an exceptional basis, this is necessary to allow MINURSO to carry out its mandate in an effective manner. In this regard, we commend the cooperation between MINURSO and the Kingdom of Morocco and their support for the ceasefire. We believe that the Polisario Front should cooperate fully with MINURSO and should remove all obstacles that could impact the work of the mission and to commit to the ceasefire. In conclusion, we reaffirm our support to the Kingdom of Morocco and its sovereignty over the Moroccan Sahara. We look forward for the UN to continue its constructive efforts in order to reach a solution for this issue that lasted for decades, and this will help strength, strengthen security and stability in the region a region that is facing many challenges. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United Arab Emirates for their statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. The 9,461st meeting of the Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is identical letters dated 19th January 2016 from the Permanent Representative of Colombia to the United Nations addressed to the Secretary General and the President of the Security Council, S-2016-53. The agenda is adopted. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I wish to draw the attention of Council members to document S-2023-701, the report of the Secretary General on the United Nations Verification Mission in Colombia. Members of the Council have before them document S-2023-808, the text of a draft resolution submitted by the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The Council is ready to proceed to the vote on the draft resolution before it. I shall put the draft resolution to the vote now. Will those in favor of the draft resolution contained in document S-2023-808 please raise their hand?
the draft resolution has been adopted unanimously as resolution 2704 2023. I now give the floor to those members of the council who wish to make statements after the vote. I give the floor to the representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. And I'd like to thank colleagues for the constructive engagement during negotiations. The United Kingdom welcomes this consensus adoption, which sends a strong signal of support for the peace process in Colombia. And as Women, Peace and Security High Level Week draws to a close, it is fitting that this council has recognized the efforts of the UN verification mission to incorporate gender as a cross-cutting issue in implementing its mandate and ensuring adequate gender expertise. Thank you. I thank the representative of the United Kingdom for their statement, and I now give the floor to the representative of Ghana. Mr. President, the A3 welcomes the unanimous adoption of the resolution on the expansion of the mandate of the United Nations Verification Mission in Colombia, presented by the United Kingdom, to whom we thank for their dedicated effort in conducting the negotiations to reach a consensual text. The vote in favor of this resolution reiterates our commitment to supporting the government and the Colombian people towards building a stable and lasting peace. Guided by the trust that Colombia has placed in the United Nations to verify the implementation of the peace agreement in the country, and given the remarkable achievements registered so far in the negotiations with the National Liberation Army, ELN, we are committed to supporting the mission in its continued monitoring and verification of the ceasefire agreement between the government of Colombia and the Estado Mayor Central contingent on the necessary conditions set forth by the Secretary General. We'll continue to monitor and encourage further advancement of the ethnic chapter of the peace agreement, an important component of the agreement which, which will go far in re-establishing justice and equality for all Colombian people, including Afro-Colombians and indigenous people. In concluding, the A3 will continue to offer its unwavering support to the verification mission and the special representative as they diligently monitor the and enforce compliance with the commitments of the Colombian peace agreement. Their exemplary performance in this role deserves acknowledgement and reinforces our commitment to their ongoing efforts. I thank you. I thank the representative of Ghana for their statement and I now give the floor to the representative of Japan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we are pleased the Council came together today to unanimously extend the mandate of the UN verification mission in Colombia for another 12 months. We are particularly delighted that our reference to the importance of including youth in the peace process was reflected. As a driving force of the future, the voices and the active participation of youth should be protected, respected, and promoted for the peace process to be sustainable. Protection for young community members and leaders is needed to ensure their full and effective participation in peace-building efforts. The need to provide protection of young community members and leaders to ensure their full and effective participation in peace-building efforts was also part of the advice from the Peace-Building Commission to the Security Council. And this practice will strengthen relations between the PBC and the Council, which Japan believes is important. We hope that such good practices will, will be enhanced. We also welcome the emphasis on the efforts of the UN Verification Mission to continue to integrate a gender perspective as a cross-cutting issue into its work, among other perspectives. To conclude, Japan reaffirms its firm support for the work of the UN Verification Mission and will remain committed to supporting the peace process and the peace-building efforts in Colombia. I thank you. I thank the representative of Japan for their statement. I shall now make a statement in my capacity as the representative of Brazil. I'll speak in Spanish. Distinguished colleagues, Brazil congratulates the members of the Security Council on the unanimous adoption of the mandate renewal for the United Nations Verification Mission in Colombia. Brazil thanks the United Kingdom for its sterling work as penholder. 
the work of the Security Council in Colombia is in line with and must always be in line with the needs and priorities of Colombia as expressed by its government. In this connection, we are delighted to note that the resolution adopted today fully reflects the sovereign will of that country. Brazil supports the strategy of the Petro government to achieve a total peace. We recognize the importance of and the need for the additional dialogues that are underway to spread the dividends of peace throughout the country in its entirety. We continue to follow with interest and optimism the dialogue of the government with the self-proclaimed group Estado Mayor Central, EMC. As in the case with the ELN, we hope that the Council will be able to authorize the mission to verify the implementation of the ceasefire agreement with the EMC when the necessary degree of maturity has been reached on this front. It is important to optimize the contribution that the Council makes to progress across the various negotiation processes underway in Colombia with the ultimate goal of encouraging ceasefires both with the government and between the groups that continue to be engaged in territorial disputes. The peace process in Colombia is an example for the world of how to prioritize and incorporate the perspective of women, peace and security into work. The the verification mission in Colombia must also reflect that reality, guaranteeing the integration of a gender perspective in each facet of the work underway to build and consolidate peace is vital to achieve broader and sustainable solutions. We're not adding work to a mandate, but what we're doing is strengthening the quality of our approach, the approach that is that we adopt for the peace processes. Tackling issues crucial to peace in Colombia, from rural reform to the reincorporation of former combatants using a gender-sensitive approach enriches our work and strengthens the foundations for a lasting peace in the country. Once again, we congratulate the people and government for Colombia on their tireless efforts to seek, achieve and consolidate total peace across its territory. Peace is the only path possible to guarantee the prosperity and the peaceful civic coexistence of all Colombia's people. The renewal of the verification mission's mandate by the Security Council is an invaluable contribution to the lasting success of this vital but crucial journey that Colombia has embarked upon. I thank you. I resume my function as President of the Council. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned.
162nd meeting of the Secu Security Council is called to order. The provisional agenda for this meeting is the situation in the Middle East, including the Palestinian question. The agenda is adopted. In accordance with Rule 37 of the Council's Provisional Rules of Procedure, I invite the representatives of Israel and Jordan to participate in this meeting. It's so decided. I propose that the Council invite the permanent observer of the Observer State of Palestine to the United Nations to participate in this meeting in accordance with the provisional rules of procedure and the previous practice in this regard. There being no objection, it is so decided. In accordance with Rule 39 of the Council's provisional rules of procedure, I, invo I invited the following briefers to participate in this meeting. Mr. Filippi Lazzarini, Commissioner, Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine, Refugees in the Near East. Ms. Catherine Russell, Executive Director of the United Nations Children's Fund. And Ms. Lisa Dothan, Director of the Humanitarian Financing and Resourcing Mobilization Division of the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. It's so decided. The Security Council will now begin its consideration of item two of the agenda. I now give the floor to Mr. Filippi Lazzarini. Mr. President, member of the Council, the last three weeks have been horrific. Almost everyone in Israel, the occupied Palestinian territory, and the broader region is in mourning. The horrific attacks by Hamas in Israel on October 7 were shocking. The relentless bombardment by the Israeli forces of the Gaza Strip are shocking. The level of destruction is unprecedented. The human tragedy unfolding under our watch is unbearable. One million people, half the population of Gaza were pushed from the north of the Gaza Strip towards the south in three weeks. The south, however, has not been spared from bombardment with significant number killed. I have said many times, and I will say it again, no place is safe in Gaza. Now, civilians remaining in the north are receiving evacuation notices from the Israeli forces urging them south to receive scarce humanitarian assistance. But many, including pregnant women, people with disabilities, the sick and the wounded, are unable to move. What happened and continues to happen is forced displacement. Over 670,000 displaced people are now in overcrowded UNRWA schools and buildings. They live in appalling unsanitary conditions with limited food and water, sleeping on the floor without mattresses or outside in the open. Hunger and despair are turning into anger against the international community. And in Gaza, the international community is better known as UNRWA. Mr. President, nearly 70% of those reported killed are children and women. Say the children reported yesterday that nearly 3,200 children were killed in Gaza in just three weeks. This surpasses the number of children killed annually across the world's conflict zones since 2019. This cannot be collateral damage. Churches, mosques, hospitals, and UNRWA facilities, including those shattering displaced people, have not been spared. Too many people have been killed and injured while seeking safety in places protected by international humanitarian law. The current siege imposed on Gaza is collective punishment. Two weeks of full siege followed by the trickle of aid last week mean that basic services are crumbling, 
Medicine is running out. Food and water are running out. Fuel is running out. The streets of Gaza have started overflowing with sewage, which will cause a massive health hazard very soon. In the latest blow, the communication blackout over the weekend has aggravated the panic and distress of people. The blackout meant that people could not communicate with their loved ones inside Gaza to know who is dead or who is alive. They no longer knew whether they would receive bread from UNRWA. They felt abandoned and cut off from the rest of the world. The communication blackout has accelerated the breaking down of civil order. Panic pushed thousands of desperate people to head to the UNRWA warehouses and distribution center where we store the food and other supply we started receiving via Egypt last week. A further breakdown in civil order will make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for the largest UN agency in Gaza to continue operating. It will also make it impossible to bring in convoys. I say this while being fully aware that UNRWA is the last remaining lifeline for the Palestinian people in Gaza. Member of the Council, UNRWA is calling on you for support. I lost 64 colleagues in just over three weeks. The last tragic passing confirmed was two hours ago. Samir, head of security and safety in the Middle Region, was killed with his wife and eight children. This is the highest number of UN aid worker killed in a conflict in such a short time. My 13,000 colleagues in Gaza are from a community of 1.7 million Palestinian refugees out of 2.2 million residents in the Gaza Strip. Those who are alive have, for the most part, lost relatives, friends, neighbors, and are displaced like the majority of Gaza. Many of my own colleagues now live, sleep, and work in UNRWA shelters. And yet, they are showing exceptional dedication to UN value. No one can do justice to thousands of UNRWA staff who continue to work tirelessly to support their communities. These are teachers, doctors, social workers, engineers, and support staff. They are mother and father. If they were not in Gaza, they could have been your neighbor, your friends. And they are operating 150 UNRWA shelter. They are keeping one third of our health center open and run 80 mobile, mo mobile health teams. They support the in entry of humanitarian convoys and the storage and distribution of aid. They distribute the little fuel we have left to hospitals, bakeries, and shelters. My UNRWA colleagues are the only glimmer of hope for the entire Gaza Strip, a ray of light as humanity sinks into its darkest hour. But they are running out of fuel, out of water, out of food and medicine, and will soon be unable to operate. Let me be clear, the handful of convoys being allowed through Rafa is nothing compared to the needs of over 2 million people trapped in Gaza. The system in place to allow aid into Gaza is geared to fail unless there is political will to make the flow of supplies meaningful, matching the unprecedented humanitarian needs. Mr. President, Gaza has over 2 million people, half of them children. Gazans are vibrant, educated people who aspire to have normal lives, families, children, education, and dreams of a better future. Today, Gazans feel that they are not treated as other civilians. Most of them feel trapped in a war they have nothing to do with. They feel the world is equating all of them to Hamas. This is dangerous, and we know this too well from previous conflicts and crises. An entire population is being dehumanized. The atrocities of Hamas do not absolve the state of Israel from its obligation under international humanitarian law. 
Every war has rules, and this one is no exception. Hannah Arendt said, the death of human empathy is one of the first and most revealing signs of a culture that is about to fall into barbarity. More than ever, Gazan deserve our empathy. Its absence will deepen the polarization in the region and further push away any prospect of peace. Mr. President, while a lot of the focus is on Gaza, I wish, to, I wish to reiterate that another crisis is unfolding in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. The United Nations has been sounding the alarm for months on the increased violence. Palestinian fatalities this year are the highest since the UN started to keep record in 2005. At least 115 Palestinians have been killed since October 7, including 33 children. The movement restrictions imposed across the West Bank are impacting our services, including schools and health centers. Meanwhile, the situation on the Israeli-Lebanese border is getting worse, with regular exchanges of fires and civilian casualties reported. In conclusion, I'm very worried about the potential spillover of this conflict beyond Gaza, unless the following is enforced. First, there must be strict adherence to international humanitarian law. This means civilian and civilian infrastructure, including UN premises, schools, hospitals, places of worship, and shelter hosting civilian, must be protected all over the Gaza Strip, north and south, and at all times. This is not an option, it is an obligation. Second, we need a safe, unimpeded, substantial, and continuous flow of humanitarian aid, including fuel, into the Gaza Strip and across it. For this, we need an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. Third, UNRWA still needs funds. We have the necessary and largest presence on the ground. We can deliver if we have the means and the resources, including the finances to pay staff on the front lines. UNRWA has received generous contribution towards its initial flash appeal, but without a fully funded core budget, we cannot pay salaries and deliver. Finally, in these dark times, we must not lose sight of our humanity. Our empathy should apply to all, Palestinian, Israeli, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. The rules of law or of war must be followed by all parties at all times in all places. Civilians must be protected, hostages released, and a genuine humanitarian response facilitated. An, imi an, an immediate humanitarian ceasefire has become a matter of life and death for millions. The present and future of Palestinian and Israeli depend on it. I urge all member states to change the trajectory of this crisis and walk towards a genuine political solution before it's too late. Thank you. I thank Mr. Lazzarini for his briefing. I now give the floor to Ms. Catherine Russell. Uh, thank you to Ambassador Nusebe and Ambassador Franza Denesi for convening this meeting and to members of the Security Council for this opportunity to speak about the humanitarian situation in the state of Palestine and Israel. At UNICEF, we firmly believe that the true cost of this latest escalation will be measured in children's lives, those lost to the violence and those forever changed by it. After little more than three weeks, the devastating tally is quickly adding up, with rampant grave violations being committed against children. According to the Palestinian Ministry of Health, more than 8,300 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza, including over 3,400 children with over 6,300 children injured. This means that more than 420 children are being killed or injured in Gaza every day, a number that should shake each of us to our core. Of course, the violence being perpetrated against children extends beyond the Gaza Strip. In the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, at least 37 children have reportedly been killed. And of course, more than 30 Israeli children have reportedly been killed, while at least 20 children remain hostage in the Gaza Strip, their fates unknown. Civilian infrastructure has also come under fierce attack. 
According to the World Health Organization in Gaza, 34 attacks have been reported against healthcare facilities, including 21 hospitals. 12 of Gaza's 35 hospitals, which are also being used as shelters for displaced people, can no longer function. At least 221 schools and more than 177,000 housing units have been damaged or destroyed. Meanwhile, what little clean water remains in Gaza is quickly running out, leaving more than 2 million people in dire need. We estimate that 55 percent of water supply infrastructure requires repair or rehabilitation. Only one desalination plant is operating at just 5 percent capacity, while all six of Gaza's water waste treatment plants are now non-operational due to a lack of fuel or power. The lack of clean water and sanitation is on the verge of becoming a catastrophe. Unless access to clean water is urgently restored, more civilians, including children, will fall ill or die from dehydration or waterborne diseases. As if this wasn't enough, children in both Israel and the state of Palestine are experiencing terrible trauma, the consequences of which could last a lifetime. <clears throat> Studies have shown that violence and upheaval can induce toxic stress in children that interferes with their physical and cognitive development and causes mental health problems over both the short and the long terms. We are doing our best to reach all children in need, but the delivery of humanitarian aid, especially in Gaza, is now extremely challenging. This is due to both the current siege conditions imposed on Gaza and the highly dangerous circumstances under which our staff are operating. Some of our staff have lost close family members, including spouses and children. And of course, we are grieving with UNRWA for their staff members who have been killed. Two days ago, we lost contact with our colleagues in Gaza when telecommunications were disrupted. This left them at even greater risk, and it made their work to help children even harder to accomplish. Excellencies, UNICEF and our partners are committed to staying on the ground to deliver for children. But make no mistake, the situation grows worse by the hour, and without an urgent end to the hostilities, I am deeply afraid for the fate of the region's children. But we, and you have the power to help lift children out of this spiral of violence. I implore the Security Council to immediately adopt a resolution that reminds parties of their obligations under international law, that calls for a ceasefire, that demands the parties allow safe and unimpeded humanitarian access, that demands the immediate and safe release of all abducted children, and that urges parties to afford children the special protection to which they are entitled. The Security Council should prioritize what is now a worsening displacement crisis with more than 1.4 million people in Gaza, the majority of whom are children now displaced. As the Secretary General has said, the order for 1.1 million Palestinian civilians to leave northern Gaza should be rescinded. Demands for hospital evacuations should also cease, given their protected status under international humanitarian law. All parties must stop violence and prevent any grave violations committed against children. We must have humanitarian access through all crossing points into the Gaza Strip through safe and efficient supply routes. And parties must ensure the safe and unimpeded movement of humanitarian supplies and personnel throughout the Gaza Strip for the delivery of humanitarian assistance, including but not limited to food, water, <coughs> medicines, fuel, and electricity. Finally, measures to prevent electricity, food, water, and fuel from entering Gaza from Israel must be immediately reversed so that civilians have access to the services they need to survive. Excellencies, UNICEF was created almost 77 years ago out of the ashes of World War II. Since then, our commitment to our mission has never wavered. We advocate for the rights of every child. On behalf of all the children caught in this nightmare, we call on the world to do better. Whether they are young people attending a music festival or children going about their daily lives in Gaza, they all deserve peace. Children do not start conflicts, and they are powerless to stop them. They need all of us to put their safety and security at the forefront of our efforts and to imagine a future where children are healthy, safe, and educated. No child deserves any less. Thank you. I thank Mrs. Russell for her briefing. I now give the floor to Mrs. Lisa Dufton. Thank you, Mr. President. 
I'm delivering this statement on behalf of Emergency Relief Coordinator and Undersecretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, Mr. Martin Griffiths, who is currently on mission in Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. The events that have unfolded since 7 October have been nothing short of devastating and heartbreaking. We do not forget the 1,400 people killed and thousands more injured and taken in the brutal Hamas attack. Indiscriminate rocket fire continues from Gaza into populated areas of Israel, causing more civilian casualties and displacement and trauma. We deplore that 230 people held hostage in Gaza. All hostages must be released immediately and unconditionally. We welcome all diplomatic efforts to secure their release and demand that in the interim they be treated humanely and be allowed to receive visits from the International Committee of the Red Cross. As you've just heard from Commissioner General Lazzarini, the situation for the more than two million people trapped in the Gaza Strip is catastrophic. They've now endured a siege and continuous bombardment for 23 days. According to the Ministry of Health in Gaza, more than 8,000 people have been killed, 66% of whom are said to be women and children. <coughs> Tens of thousands more have been injured. The scale of the horror people are experiencing in Gaza is really hard to convey. People are becoming increasingly desperate as they search for food, water, and shelter amid the relentless bombing campaign that's wiping out whole families and entire neighborhoods. In their desperation, People have resorted to breaking into UN warehouses in search of food and water. Dehydration is an increasing concern, as is the possibility of the spread of disease and other health concerns due to unsafe water and breakdown in sewage treatment services. More than 1.4 million people are internally displaced in Gaza, and hundreds of thousands of children, women, and men are crammed into overcrowded shelters and hospitals. Many of these people have moved south in search of safety. But the reality is that nowhere is safe, and we simply don't have enough essential supplies to provide for the survival of internally displaced people at this scale. As we heard from Executive Director Russell, the health care system is in tatters. Patients lie on the floors and in corridors. Surgeons are operating without anesthesia. Out of an estimated 50,000 pregnant women, 5,500 are due to deliver within the next 30 days. For the 1,000 patients dependent on dialysis and the 130 premature babies in incubators, life hangs by a thread as hospital backup generators run on fumes. Some 9,000 cancer patients are not receiving adequate care. We're deeply concerned by allegations of military installations in the close vicinity of hospitals and the request by Israeli authorities for hospitals, including Al-Quds and Shifa, to be evacuated. There's nowhere safe for these patients to go. And for those on life support and babies in incubators, moving would almost certainly be a death sentence. Mr. President, the provision of humanitarian relief is extremely complex and challenging due to the bombardment, the destruction of infrastructure, and as we've said repeatedly, the lack of fuel. We mourn the loss of 64 UNRWA colleagues and other humanitarian staff who've been tragically killed and we extend our deepest condolences to the families and colleagues. We have the utmost admiration for the bravery, selflessness, and commitment of humanitarian workers who are delivering aid to those in need in this perilous environment. Mr. President, we welcome the agreement that has allowed us to get some relief into Gaza via the Rafah border crossing, but these deliveries are a drop in the ocean compared to the vast scale of needs. It's imperative that we're able to get humanitarian supplies and relief into Gaza safely, reliably, without impediment, and at the scale required. In particular, urgent for us to replenish fuel supplies, which are vital for powering most essential services, including hospitals and water desalination plants, and to transport humanitarian relief inside Gaza. And more than one entry point into Gaza is indispensable if we are to make a difference. Karim Shalom between Israel and Gaza is the only crossing equipped to rapidly process a sufficient, sufficiently large number of trucks. Meanwhile, in the West Bank, scores of civilians have been killed and incidents of settler violence have increased, causing hundreds of civilians to be displaced. Likewise, the violence and closure of checkpoints has impeded access to essential services and food distribution. 
the permits of some 150,000 to 175,000 Palestinians from the West Bank working in Israel and settlements are now suspended. The situation is causing significant damage to the West Bank economy and Palestinian institutions. We have very real fears about what lies ahead. The current situation may pale in comparison with what is to come. There is a genuine risk that this war could escalate further and spill over into wider region. We must take urgent collective action to prevent this. Mr. President, in light of all that has been described today, what we're calling for is for the parties to agree to pause the fighting on humanitarian grounds. It would provide the required calm and safety for hostages to be released and for the UN to replenish supplies, relieve exhausted personnel, and resume assistance throughout Gaza wherever civilians are in need. It would also provide much needed respite to civilians who are living under unimaginably traumatic conditions. But with or without a pause in the fighting, I reiterate that all parties on all sides must respect international humanitarian law. This means allowing relief in and taking constant care to spare civilians and civilian objects, including humanitarian and medical workers, facilities, and assets. And this applies whether civilians move or they stay. We are relying on the responsibility of every member state here and across the UN to use all of their influence to ensure that the rules of war are respected and that as far as is possible, civilians are spared further suffering. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Ms. Dufton for her briefing. And I shall now make a, stand, a statement in my capacity as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Brazil. Distinguished representatives, I thank the briefers for their extensive information on the humanitarian situation on the ground and commend the work of their teams in Locus and elsewhere. They honor once again the work of this organization and everything it stands for. Following instructions of President Lula, I come back before you again today with a profound sense of urgency and dismay. We must always bear in mind the human faces on both sides of the conflict. Therefore, I extend Brazil's deepest condolences to the families and friends of all civilians, including the brave and dedicated United Nations personnel who have lost their lives in the ongoing crisis stemming from the protracted conflict in Israel and Palestine, tragically reignited by the terrorist actions by Hamas against Israel on October 7th. Nothing justifies such crimes. All hostages must be immediately and unconditionally released, and access to them by the Red Cross must be immediately granted. At the same time, the current situation in Gaza is deeply appalling and indefensible by any humane standard and under humanitarian, international humanitarian law. An alarming humanitarian catastrophe is unfolding before our eyes with thousands of civilians, including an overwhelming intolerable number of children being punished by crimes they have not committed. In three weeks, we have watched this conflict claim the lives of more than 8,000 civilians, of whom more than 3,000 are children. Since the last time I spoke in this council, just last week, the count of children deaths increased by 1,000. Meanwhile, the Security Council holds meetings and hears speeches without being able to take a fundamental decision to end the human suffering on the ground. As thousands in Israel and Palestine mourn their loved ones, as Israelis agonize over the fate of hostages, as Gazans suffer under relentless military operations that are killing civilians, including an intolerable number of children, we have the means to get something done, and yet we repeatedly and shamefully fail. Since October 7th, we have met several times and considered four draft resolutions. However, we remain at impasse due to, international, due to internal disagreements, 
particularly among some permanent members, and thanks to the persistent use of the Council to achieve self-oriented purposes instead of putting the protection of civilians above all. The grave and unprecedented human crisis before us require that the sterile rivalries be relinquished, that the Council is not able to discharge its responsibility of safeguarding international peace and security due to old antagonisms, antagonism is morally unacceptable. Let us not fool ourselves. The eyes of the world are staring at us and will not move away from our distressing inability to act. They all see that our incapacity to unite in response to the human crisis facing us today questions the very raison d'etre of this council. Someone has even written that in addition to civilians, this body lies beneath the rubbles in Gaza. The difference is that we are our own so, so saviors. We just need to do what is right to spare innocent lives from the scourge of wars. There may still be time to rescue the Council and sustain the hope that many of us still have in our capacity to be true to our mandate under the Charter. It is possible only if it's enough political will, if there is enough political will to compromise and to be minimally balanced and inclusive in our diagnosis and way forward. Failure to do so, yet another failure, failure will add an increasingly higher cost in human lives above all, but also to multilateralism in general, to the United States and to this council in particular. Last week, a uh, hope for consensus seemed to emerge echoing the Secretary General's call for a humanitarian ceasefire as the 10th emergency special session of the General Assembly passed a resolution that called for humanitarian truce leading to a cessation of hostilities. A light at the end of the tunnel seemed to appear also when the Secretary General, who had personally been in the region to assess the situation on the ground, announced the opening of the Rafa border crossing for some initial aid deliveries and some hostages were released. The United Nations, through its secretariat, under the leadership of the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, UNRWA, and other bodies and agencies, has been working tirelessly to address the human crisis facing us. It rests on Security Council the responsibility to follow through. The price of inaction is unacceptably high. The growing urgency for the families of the hostages and the unbearable pain for the civilian population in Gaza cannot be understated. The positive first step taken by the UN bodies and agencies do not go far enough as the escalation of the conflict makes the situation more dire by the hour. The relevance of a resolution of the Security Council lies on the need for sustainable sustained humanitarian aid and for granting safe working conditions for those involved in rescuing hostages and providing humanitarian work. The cessation of hostilities is therefore to the benefit of the civilian population on both sides. All the risk of reinstating the obvious, I want to put it bluntly. There cannot be rescuing of hostages and humanitarian aid under shells. This is why Brazil and fellow E10, E10 members have been working tirelessly to try to get this council to act more decisively since the last showdown around proposed uh, resolutions. In Brazil's view, the main goals are clear the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, and the end of violence through whatever modalities can be agreed without further delay, so that rapid, safe, unhindered, and sufficient humanitarian aid can be delivered to the strained people of Gaza. Besides the 8,000 lives lost, many more are about to meet their fatal de destiny as hospitals have no means to keep providing basic treatment for the patients. Therefore, 
providing essential resources to those in Gaza, including water, food, medical supply, fuel, and electricity, is urgent and imperative. Surgeries are being performed without anesthesia. Lives are being lost at hospitals for lack of energy and the most basic medic supply, medical supplies. Food and water are scarce and prices have skyrocketed. And the flow of humanitarian aid so far amounts to little more than a photo op. Tanks and troops are on the ground in Gaza and time for action is running out. My questions to you all are, if not now, when? How many more lives will be lost until we finally move from rhetoric to action? It is also critical and urgent to allow for the safe and immediate evacuation of foreign nationals from Gaza and from elsewhere in the region if they feel threatened. While every state has the right and duty to protect its citizens, actions must be consistent with international law and international humanitarian law, in particular, the principles of distinction, proportionality, precaution, military necessity, and humanity. The right and duty to protect a state's population cannot and should not come at the cost of more deaths of civilians and more destructions of civilian infrastructure. As the UN Secretary General Guterres has repeatedly reminded us, even wars have rules. Any indiscriminate attack against civilians and critical infrastructure, as well as depriving civilians of basic goods and service, are morally unjustifiable and illegal under international humanitarian law. Brazil strongly condemns actions that blur the line between civilians and combatants. Today, UNRWA shed light on the grim and disheartening reality in Gaza, highlighting the objectionable level of destruction of civilian infra infrastructure and tragic loss of innocent lives, including uh, those of women, children, at least 35 and at least 35 of its staff. The World Health Organization has been constantly recalling the urgent need for the cessation of violence and for the humanitarian action at a time when Gaza's health infrastructure is on the verge of collapse. Beyond the immediate and very urgent humanitarian considerations, a threat to regional stability looms and any repercussion could be catastrophic. Brazil urges a united shift towards de-escalation and calls on all parties to act with the utmost restraint. A cessation of hostilities, hostilities is urgently needed to create the conditions for a full, durable, and respected ceasefire and the resumption of a credible peace process. All this is at stake as we keep our efforts to get this Council to act with a unified voice. Distinguished members of the Council, international humanitarian law provides a clear path to avoid at least great or at least greatly alleviate civilian suffering. The framework for collective action is clear. Our collective response to this crisis, which we all fear will only worsen if nothing is done, will be a defining moment for the United Nations. The staggering, staggering fact is that the Security Council does not have a reasonable record when it comes to maintaining international peace and security in the Middle East. Issues related to the region in general received 35 of the 250 vetoes of the permanent members. Since 2016, the Council has not been able to pass a single resolution on the situation in Palestine. The situation in the Middle East is therefore by far one of the most, most blocked issues in the Security Council. This speaks of ineffectiveness of, governance, of the governance system and of the lack of representation of certain parts of the world in this body. A decision 
on the humanitarian aspects of the current crisis will certainly not redress the historic failure of the Security Council regarding the situation in the Middle East. It will, however, stop further human suffering now. Thank you. I, oh. Sorry. I, wa I would like for the register to read again Another sentence that uh, I, that that was misspelled in my in my speech. Uh, the sentence is on page four. Failure to do so, yet another failure, will add an increasingly higher cost in human lives above all, but also to multilateralism in general and to the United Nations and this Council in particular. I thank you. I resume now my function as president of the council. I now give the floor to the permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates. Mr. President, thank you for your presence here with us in New York today and for the special dedication that Brazil has given to peace in our region. I also pay special tribute to our briefers today and to their team's dedicated work in the most unimaginable circumstances on the ground in the Gaza Strip. Commissioner General Lazzarini, I was very shaken by your recent words to your staff over the weekend in which you said, I am constantly hoping that this hell on earth will soon come to an end. I want to extend the UAE's deep condolences for the 64 UNRWA workers killed in this war. They paid the ultimate sacrifice for the life-saving work the United Nations does every day around the world, and we have failed to protect them. Last Friday, 121 countries, representing an overwhelming majority of the world, issued an unambiguous call for an immediate, durable, and sustained humanitarian truce in Gaza. They stood up for the humanitarian imperative, for human rights, for international law, and most importantly, for the self-evident truth that Palestinian life is precious, equal, and deserving of the full protection of the law. We have heard many say that the 2.2 million Palestinians in Gaza are not Hamas, that this is not a war against them. And while these are welcome words, it is time that action reflected them. The more than 8,000 people that have been killed in Gaza, and as we've heard today, 70% of whom were women and children, were surely not all Hamas. Nearly 1,000 children are missing and may be trapped or dead under the rubble. They are not Hamas. Will we help them? The number of Palestinian children killed in just three weeks of Israel's bombardment of Gaza exceeds the total number of children killed in conflicts worldwide in each of the last four years. As Ms. Russell has so eloquently said, that should stain our moral conscience if nothing else does. Children do deserve our special protection and are entitled to it today. If we lean on the General Assembly's moral authority in other settings, we must also respect it in this one. Indeed, members of this council have repeatedly expressed their concerns about the fraying of the international order. This council, ignoring the expressed will of the majority of the world, may be what breaks it. Colleagues, we need a ceasefire now. As Foreign Minister Vieira said, we need to ensure that safe, sustained, and at-scale humanitarian aid reaches Gaza now, and that access to electricity, clean water, and fuel is restored now. The shutdown of cellular and internet services over the weekend as part of the offensive meant that wounded civilians were searching for help in the dark. As we have heard today, there have been over 76 attacks on healthcare, including 20 hospitals and clinics damaged or destroyed. More than 650,000 people are sheltering in UNRWA facilities. Let me be absolutely clear on this point. These sites are protected by international humanitarian law. Announcements that they are targets 
or warnings for them to evacuate. Do not, I repeat, do not alter their protected status. We need to see the rescission of dangerous, unrealistic evacuation orders. On Saturday, the Palestinian Red Crescent reported warnings from Israel to immediately evacuate Al-Quds Hospital, which hosts hundreds of patients, including newborn babies in incubators. Around 12,000 civilians are also seeking refuge there right now as we sit here in this chamber in New York, speaking to each other again and again and debating the language of our humanitarian resolution and response. An evacuation order in these conditions is cruel. It is reckless, and so is our delay as a Security Council. Mr. President, all of Gaza's civilian population is at risk by the escalating hostilities, as are the Israeli and international hostages taken by Hamas, wrongly taken by Hamas. While our eyes have been trained on Gaza, the occupied West Bank has not been spared from violence either. Israeli settlers are escalating their attacks against Palestinian civilians and forcing their displacement. These attacks must be prevented by the State of Israel. Across the region, there have been several credible warnings of a wider escalation. The drums of war are beating. Colleagues, taking these warnings seriously begins with stopping this war in Gaza. We do not serve Israel's security by enabling it to go on. We cannot reverse the heinous October 7th attacks by condoning this war in which civilians are paying the price. Ignoring what could happen day after day will have devastating consequences, not only for Israelis and Palestinians, but for the prospects of peace and stability in our region. Mr. President, as we work on responding to the General Assembly's clear call on this body to live up to its responsibilities under the UN Charter, we should also keep in mind always the dying words of the dead so that their memories are a blessing to us. I'd like to speak today of an Arab poet, Heba Abu Neda, a Palestinian woman killed in Khan Yunus several days ago. My friend's circle diminishes, turning into little coffins scattered everywhere. As missiles launch, I can't grasp the fleeting moments with my friends. These aren't just names, they are reflections of us with a unique face and identity. Colleagues, we may have failed the dead, but we must channel our sorrow into saving the living. The time to reverse course is running out. What we and 121 countries are advocating for may be the harder road, but history warns us of the consequences of not taking it. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, first of all, I would like to thank Brazil for organizing today's meeting upon the request of UAE and China. I thank Commissioner General Lazzarini, Executive Director Russell, and Ms. Dalton for their briefings. Your briefings underscored once again the gravity of the situation in Gaza and the urgency for the Council to act. Last Friday, the 10th Emergency Special Session of the General Assembly adopted by an overwhelming majority a resolution calling for an immediate and a durable humanitarian pause leading to a cessation of hostilities. This reflected the widespread call on the part of the international community. Regrettably and unacceptably, however, Israel, turning a deaf ear to the common concerns of the international community, has chosen to further escalate its military operations in Gaza and formally declared the launch of a ground assault. Secretary-General Guterres has warned that the population in Gaza is facing a disaster of an avalanche proportion. Having one of the highest population density in the world, Gaza is a land that has been under blockade for 16 long years. 
the 2.3 million innocent people are living in utter fear amidst the indiscriminate bombardment and have been cut off from water, electricity, food and fuel for 21 days. Just this past weekend, they experienced a communication blackout that lasted for nearly 36 hours. If left checked, unchecked, the situation will spiral further out of control and an even greater humanitarian catastrophe will be inevitable. We express our deep sympathy to the people in Gaza who are struggling on the brink of life and death, and we are equally, if not more, deeply worried about the Middle East peace pro prospect process which is on the brink of collapse. China solemnly calls on the parties to the conflict to cease all hostilities, disengage immediately, set in place a humanitarian truce, and make every effort to prevent the situation from escalating further. China solemnly calls on Israel as the occupying power to fulfill its obligations under the international humanitarian law, lift its siege over Gaza, immediately rescind its evacuation order, and expeditiously restore the supply of basic necessities so as to prevent an even larger humanitarian disaster. China solemnly calls for intensified diplomatic efforts to facilitate the release of the hostages without delay and to work on this basis to seek to open up space for dialogue so as to return to the track of a political settlement. China solemnly calls on all parties China solemnly calls on the power that has a special power on the parties concerned to put aside their own self-interests and geopolitical considerations and make every effort to stop the war and restore peace. Mr. President, the decades-long history of the Palestinian-Israel issue has taught us that military means are not the solution. Absolute security cannot be achieved by imposing collective punishment on civilians, and responding to violence with violence will only exacerbate hatred and confrontation. We call on the parties to the conflict to abandon their blind faith in the use of force and commit themselves to breaking the cycle of violence and achieving common security. There is no firewall in Gaza. It is a dangerous myth to think that a contained war is possible there. Allowing the fighting in Gaza to continue could very well turn it into a military catastrophe that will engulf the entire region. The situation in the West Bank and along the Lebanese-Israeli border has already sounded the alarm. We call on all parties concerned about the spillover of the conflict to devote their efforts towards promoting a ceasefire in Gaza. As long as the war rages, more violations of international humanitarian law are bound to happen. Without a comprehensive ceasefire, humanitarian assistance, no matter how much there is, will only be a drop in the ocean. What the people of Gaza need now is more than just a reiteration by the Council of the importance of international humanitarian law and the reputation of unfulfilled promises of protection. What they need is concrete actions to restore peace, uphold the law, the rule of law, and save lives. The Council has so far held several meetings on the situation of Palestine and Israel, and it cannot be said that there was no consensus at all. The resolution just adopted by the General Assembly has also pointed the Council in the right direction. In the face of the current critical situation, China once again solemnly calls on the Council to strengthen unity, build consensus, and take responsible and meaningful action as soon as possible. We believe that so long as we focus on the most pressing issues on hand, such as a ceasefire and an end to the fighting, the protection of civilians, and the prevention of a larger humanitarian disaster, it is possible for the members of this council to reach a consensus, and indeed, this is what they should do. At this juncture, silence means acquiesce, and inaction is tantamount to a green light. The eyes of the world are upon us, and history will record our Choice. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the permanent representative of China for his statement, and I now I now give the floor to the permanent representative of the United States. Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioner General Lazzarini, Executive Director Russell, and Director Dalton, I want to express my heartfelt 
Gratitude to you and your teams for the courageous work done by you under the most difficult circumstances. Humanitarian actors have stepped up, as they always do, to try and save lives in the midst of the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. This work is heroic, but tragically, it comes with great risk. We mourn the more than 60 UN staff who've been killed in Gaza since the start of this conflict. The lives of UN personnel must be protected. The lives of humanitarian workers must be protected. The lives of journalists must be protected. The lives of all civilians, innocent civilians, Israeli and Palestinians, men and women, children and elderly must be protected. There's no hierarchy when it comes to protecting civilian lives. A civilian is a civilian is a civilian. Colleagues, it's been three weeks since Hamas killed more than 1,400 innocent civilians and took more than 200 people hostage. Gaza-based militants continue to fire barrages of rockets toward Israel. Citizens from dozens of member states are still being held hostage by Hamas. And the humanitarian crisis in Gaza is growing more dire by the day. At this moment of pain and sorrow and suffering, we must all come together. We must all come together to call for the immediate and unconditional release of all hostages, address the immense humanitarian needs of Palestinian civilians in Gaza, affirm Israel's right to defend itself from terrorism, and remind all actors that international humanitarian law must be respected. That means Hamas must not use Palestinians as human shields, an act of unthinkable cruelty and a violation of the law of war. And that means Israel must take all possible precautions to avoid harm to civilians. Yesterday, President Biden spoke to Prime Minister Netanyahu and reiterated that while Israel has the right and responsibility to defend its citizens from terrorism, it must do so in a manner consistent with international humanitarian law. The fact that Hamas operates within and under the cover of civilian areas creates an added burden for Israel. But it does not lessen its responsibility to distinguish between terrorists and innocent civilians. Colleagues, the United States is also deeply concerned by the significant uptick in violence against Palestinian civilians in the West Bank. We condemn the killings of Palestinian civilians, and we urge Israel to prevent these attacks working with the Palestinian Authority. The Biden administration also shares the international community's concern about telecommunications shutdowns in Gaza. We've made this clear to Israeli leaders, and we understand communication networks have started to be restored. This is essential. A shutdown of telecommunication imperils the lives of civilians, UN personnel, and humanitarian workers, and risks exacerbating the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Lives hang in the balance, and we must all step up, as the United States has done. We are the single largest donor to the Palestinian people, having contributed more than $1 billion to UNRWA since 2021. And President Biden recently announced an additional $100 million in humanitarian assistance for the Palestinian people in Gaza and the West Bank. But of course, no amount of aid will matter if it cannot reach people in need. And the United States continues to work with Israel, Egypt, the UN, and other partners to facilitate rapid and sustained assistance flow. Food, fuel, water, medicine, and other essential services must be restored. And while the number of trucks entering Gaza continues to increase, it is not nearly enough. The amount of humanitarian assistance flowing into Gaza must be scaled up urgently. We must do everything possible to save lives. And President Biden has expressed 
his support for humanitarian pauses in the fighting to allow hostages to get out, to allow humanitarian aid to reach Gaza and be distributed, and to allow safe passage for civilians, which will help people access humanitarian assistance or move to safer locations. We also continue to urge all member states to work to prevent any spillover of the crisis. Last week, Secretary Blinken asked this council to send a firm, united message to any state or non-state actor that is considering opening up another front against Israel or who may target Israel's partners, including the United States. Don't. This is a matter of international peace and security, and this council must speak out. That is one of the many reasons that last week the United States put forward a strong and balanced Security Council resolution, one that we consulted with all member states on and we worked to forge consensus around. This resolution received the support of the majority of this council, but Russia and China blocked its adoption. Following this veto, action moved to the General Assembly, where member states were asked to vote for a resolution that was grossly one-sided and was missing two key words, Hamas and hostage. These are deliberate omissions that give cover and empower Hamas's brutality. During the emergency special session, we also heard a few member states implicitly endorse Hamas's acts of violence, and I was frankly shocked and appalled. It is outrageous and it must be called out. It is unconscionable that Hamas's actions are not condemned by the General Assembly. Colleagues, as I've said before, the United States will continue to engage with any council member, with any member state that is committed to adopting a strong and balanced resolution. But any council product must support direct diplomacy efforts that can save lives and advance the prospects of a more peaceful and secure future for the region. Even at this difficult moment, we must keep hope alive. We must work toward a brighter future, a future where Israelis and Palestinians have equal measures of security, freedom, justice, opportunity, and dignity, a future where Palestinians realize their legitimate right to self-determination and a state of their own, a future where two democratic states, Israel and Palestine, live side by side in peace. This is not the future Hamas wants to see, but it is the future that we must all work to advance together. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the permanent representative of the United States for her statement. And I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Ecuador. Señor Presidente. Mr. President, to begin, I wish to thank Mr. Philippe Lazzarini and Ms. Lisa Dutton and Catherine Russell for their grave briefings this afternoon. I wish to thank them for all of the work of UNWA, OCHA and UNICEF in such grueling circumstances, such as those being endured by these bodies on the ground. The events in Gaza are of grave concern, Mr. President. The situation of the civilian population is desperate. The aid that is arriving is insufficient. The future is uncertain and menacing. Telecommunication blackouts that have just been referred to and the beginning of ground operations are worsening this state of affairs. Ecuador values the efforts that have been made to render viable the entry of vital supplies from Egypt. We hope that we will ultimately manage to establish a system which makes it possible to supply the civilian population in a sufficient and co continuous fashion. We recognize the right of countries to protect their civilians when international law allows. However, at the same time, we recall the obligation for that right to be exercised in full compliance at all times with international law and international humanitarian law, as we have stated on several occasions. 
uh, as Ecuador and other members of the Council indeed have stated on several occasions. We support the work of the Secretary General, that of the United Nations system, and we support the work of its agencies who have the mandate to provide humanitarian aid to the population affected by this conflict. My country has appealed vehemently for the avoidance of the spillover of this violence to other areas in the region. At this moment, I wish to draw particular attention to the need to avoid exacerbating tensions and fueling the violence in the West Bank and on the border between Lebanon and Israel. I reiterate our request to all to act with a sense of responsibility and common sense. Anything else and death more pain and more suffering will be all that await. Mr. President, as I have said on several occasions in recent weeks, this Council must speak out before the, in the face of the eruption of violence in the area and its dire humanitarian consequences. All efforts must be made to achieve this goal. Particularly, we must achieve, reach agreements between those who have the power to prevent with their will alone the adoption of a decision which enjoys the majority support of this council. It is timely to recall here that exercising greater power brings with it greater responsibility. The council must bear in mind that this organization was born to defend the dignity and worth of the human person, to ensure that reason prevailed in international relations and to create a better world for all. It is our obligation, Mr. President, to strive so that we can always discharge that mandate. I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Ecuador, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Switzerland. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. President, and I would like to thank you for, for the second time, chairing an emergency meeting of the Security Council on the situation in the Middle East this month. I would also like to thank the Commissioner General of UNRWA, Felipe Lazzarini, Director Lisa Doughton of OCHA, and the Executive Director of UNICEF, Catherine Russell, for their briefings and their efforts, and above all, all of their efforts in these particularly tragic circumstances. We offer our very sincere condolences to the UN, in particular to UNRWA, for the dozens of personnel who died in the course of their duties. Our condolences also go to the relatives of the thousands of Israeli and Palestinian civilians, more than a third of them children who have lost their lives, uh, tragically lost their lives in recent weeks. Since the 7th of October, Switzerland has strongly condemned the acts of terror, indiscriminate rocket fire against the Israeli population, and hostage taking perpetrated by Hamas. In this context, Switzerland expressed its solidarity with the Israeli people. All hostages held in Gaza must be released immediately and unconditionally. We have recognized Israel's legitimate concern for national defense and security, recalling that the legitimate needs of security and military necessity are taken into account by international humanitarian law, which must be respected by all parties to the conflict. We stress once again the binding nature of all its rules, without exception, in particular the principles of distinction, proportionality and precaution in the conduct of hostilities. All violations of international law must be investigated so that the perpetrators can be brought to justice. As it has done on many occasions, Switzerland reiterates that the application of international humanitarian law and human rights, in particular the protection of civilians, is and must remain a priority for this Council. It is therefore imperative to protect civilians and people who are no longer taking part in hostilities. We must protect them from acts of terror in Israel, and we must protect them in Gaza and the West Bank, where the increase in violence, particularly by settlers, is worrying. We must exert our influence on the parties to the conflict to ensure that international humanitarian law is respected to halt the current spiral of violence and prevent it from spreading throughout the region. As we have heard, in Gaza, the entire population, almost half of whom are children, is now under siege entirely. 
Civilian infrastructure, including UNRWA schools and, in particular, hospitals, are protected by international humanitarian law. They must be able to provide security and assistance to civilians. The population must have access in sufficient quality and quantity to essential goods and services, including drinking water, food, medical care and fuel. Switzerland has been working very actively within this Council and at the General Assembly for the respect for international humanitarian law and the introduction of measures such as humanitarian pauses or truces to guarantee access to aid. Such measures, accompanied by security guarantees, are necessary to enable the personnel of impartial humanitarian organisations to work effectively to respond to the needs of the population and to alleviate the worsening sanitary crisis in Gaza. This is all the more necessary in the light of the intensification of hostilities in recent days. Mr. President, unified action by this Council is therefore more necessary than ever to put an end to the violence, ensure respect for international law and work towards peace. Switzerland will continue to make every effort to seek such action by this Council so that it assumes its responsibility in the face of this crisis. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Switzerland for her statement, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Gabon. Merci, Monsieur. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Honorable Commissioner General Philippe Lazzarini, the Executive Director Catherine Russell, and OCHA Director Lisa Dugton for their briefings on the current situation in Gaza. I am quite frankly shocked to the core by their briefings and accounts. I wish to thank the United Arab Emirates and China for convening this emergency open briefing because we cannot, as a Security Council, remain unmoved in the face of the unbearable extent of the horror playing out before our eyes. The, intensica the intensification of Israel's airstrikes together with the ground operations of forces in Gaza is causing the huge death toll of this war to tragically skyrocket. This is a heinous war which is morally unacceptable. The paralysis of this council is unacceptable and inconceivable. 10,000 people, including 1,000 children, have been killed since the heinous attacks of Hamas in Israel on the 7th of October. It is high time for this bloodbath to cease. Gabon, once again, staunchly condemns all deadly indiscriminate violence. We wish to say the following very clearly indeed. Civilian populations must be neither currency nor human shields, nor must they be the target of collective punishment. All hostages must be released unconditionally and Israel's right to self-defense must be exercised in accordance with international humanitarian law and with the principles of proportionality, precaution and distinction. The cycle of the dehumanizing cycle of violence against civilian populations must immediately stop. Within this council, we must move beyond the bonds of the political and geopolitical bonds that bind us to inaction. We must move beyond divisions, rivalry and sterility to call for the immediate cessation of hostilities and for unhindered humanitarian access to those in need, those civilians trapped in the devastated ruins of Gaza. We call for the compliance with and implementation of the resolution adopted by the General Assembly on the 26th of October 2023. We hail the efforts to restore calm undertaken by the countries in the region. At the same time, we reiterate the security, the Secretary General's appeal for a humanitarian ceasefire. We reiterate our appeal for restraint and encourage all states that have influence that they can bring to bear on parties to ratchet up efforts to bring parties to choose peace and to preserve human life. Mr. President,
We are all aware of the risk that the Israel-Palestine conflict poses to peace and stability in the region as a whole and beyond. We must avoid a conflagration which would stand as a point of no return and would lead us into chaos once and for all. To conclude, I wish to reaffirm my country's conviction that diplomacy, dialogue and negotiation with a central role played by the United Nations are and remain vital channels to achieve a lasting solution to this deadly crisis. We reiterate our commitment to the two-state solution. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Gabon for his uh, statement, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Malta. Thank you, President. I thank the briefers, today's briefers, for their stark briefings, and also thank and applaud your teams for your important work on the ground. Commissioner General Lazzarini, we convey our sincere condolences for the tragic loss of UNRWA staff in these past weeks. For years, the agency has been an important stabilizing force in the region. In recent days, your work has been nothing short of heroic, and you can count on our full support. President, Malta is gravely concerned by the desperate situation in Gaza. Such military operations will undoubtedly have a devastating impact on the, on the more than two million civilians trapped in the enclave. Let us not forget that these civilians were already perilously vulnerable and living in dire conditions. During these last days, thousands broke into UNRWA warehouses and distribution centers, taking wheat, flour, and other basic items. This illustrates how desperate the situation on the ground is and is, worrying, is a worrying sign that civil order is starting to break down. In parallel, Hamas continues rocket barrage into Israeli territory, with some reaching Tel Aviv. This is completely unacceptable. We unequivocally reject and condemn these barbaric attacks, including the 7th October attack and the taking of hostages. These are heinous acts of terrorism. We reiterate our call on Hamas to immediately release all hostages safely and unconditionally and urge parties with influence to continue negotiations to this end. Malta condemns all violence against civilians. All parties to the conflict are obligated to abide by international law, including international humanitarian and human rights law. They must take all feasible precautions to avoid and in any event minimize harm to civilians and civilian objects. These including objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population. We are utterly devastated to note the effects the conflict is having on Palestinian and Israeli children. Thousands have perished while the rest are suffering unthinkable psychological traumas. We underscore that the killing and maiming of children, attacks on schools, hospitals, places of worship and denial of children's access to humanitarian assistance are all grave violations. We also echo the concerns raised regarding the children being held by Hamas. We reiterate our call for their immediate release and for their special protection needs to be prioritised. President. The humanitarian crisis in Gaza can no longer be ignored. Urgent action is needed. This is why we voted in favour of the General Assembly resolution last Friday at the 10th Emergency Special Session. We welcome the provisions of this resolution calling for an immediate, durable and sustained humanitarian truce leading to a cessation of hostilities. This is the minimum requirement to ensure protection of civilians. Meanwhile, we remain concerned that this Council has been unable to act in the face of this accelerating crisis. We echo the Secretary-General's message that this is a moment of truth. Our immediate priority must be to address the unfolding humanitarian catastrophe and to reverse current escalations. We urge Council members to unite in good faith and act decisively for the sake of regional and international security. We also stress 
that it is unacceptable that humanitarian actors working through the most life-threatening and extraordinary conditions to protect Gazan civilians also must contend with communications blackouts. Connectivity is of utmost importance, <coughs> not only to the civilian population, but <coughs> also so that aid responders can continue doing their critical work. <coughs> Malta reiterates the call also made in the European Council conclusions for the continued, rapid, safe and unhindered humanitarian access in Gaza, including through humanitarian corridors and pauses. All efforts made by international actors in this regard are welcome. Furthermore, we are alarmed at the precarious developments in areas outside of Gaza. It is critical that the international community works together to prevent a spillover which would further increase internal tensions and destabilize the entire region. Malta underscores that any lasting and sustainable plan for peace in the Middle East must be based on a two-state solution in line with relevant Security Council resolutions and internationally agreed parameters. De-escalation, restraint and mediation are critical. The longer we fail to address these imperatives, the harder it will become to climb out of the abyss and towards the path of peace. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Malta for her statement and I now give the floor to the permanent uh, representative of France. Monsieur le Président. Mr. President, I thank the Commissioner General of UNRWA, Executive Director of UNICEF, and the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs for their briefings. The terrorist attacks by Hamas and other groups against Israel on the 7th of October have triggered an unprecedented crisis. The humanitarian situation in Gaza is tragic. Civilians are dying every day, including many children. The population is going hungry. The lack of water brings with it the risk of epidemics and hospitals are overwhelmed. It is urgent that unfettered humanitarian access be guaranteed for the Gaza Strip that needs food, water and electricity. The number of convoys must increase significantly in order to be commensurate with what is needed. A humanitarian truce is needed, which could ultimately leave to a, lead to a ceasefire. France has significantly increased its humanitarian assistance through the chartering of a special flight last weekend and welcomes the commitment of the Secretary General, the work of UN agencies and the work of humanitarian actors on the ground who are working in extremely difficult conditions. Our most sincere condolences go to the United Nations following the deaths of 63 UNWA staff members. Civilians must be able to leave Gaza without being uh, impeded from doing so, and we have constantly requested that for our own nationals and their families since the 7th of October. Nothing can justify the suffering of civilians who must be protected. All victims develop, uh, deserve our compassion, and all lives are valuable. Israel has the right to defend itself and the duty to do so in compliance with international humanitarian law, sparing the civilian population. France voted in favor of the resolution introduced by Jordan on behalf of the Arab group, which calls for a truce and humanitarian access and for the protection of civilians, which condemns terrorist acts and which calls for the immediate and unconditional release of hostages. And I recall our condemnation in the most energetic terms of the terrorist attacks by Hamas, which in no way represents the Palestinians and which has nothing but contempt for their suffering. I also reiterate our call for the hostages to be released immediately and without condition. Following this vote in the General Assembly, this Council must be able to fully shoulder its responsibilities and achieve a just decision based on our common principles. France will continue to work on the new draft resolution presented by Brazil so that it can be adopted quickly. Mr. President, the extreme severity of the situation in Gaza should not lead us to forget what is happening in the rest of the occupied Palestinian territory. France firmly condemns the violence perpetrated by settlers against the Palestinian population, acts of violence which are increasing in the West Bank. We call on the Israeli authorities to put a stop to this. 
We must prevent this engulfing the entire region. France remains extremely worried following a launching of a shell that landed in Unifil headquarters in the south of Lebanon on the 28th of October. France is committed to avoiding a spread of this conflict. This war has reminded us, as if any reminder were necessary, that the world can no longer ignore the legitimate aspirations of the Palestinians and Israelis to live in peace and security. We all are aware of the conditions for this, namely the necessary security guarantees for Israel and a state for the Palestinians. We must all mobilize in order to restore a political horizon. The only viable solution is a two-state solution, and France will continue its engagement within this council for it to adopt a resolution as quickly as possible. We owe this to the Israelis and the Palestinians. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of France for his statement, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Albania. Thank you, Mr. President. And let me thank Commissioner General Lazzarini, Executive Director Russell, and Ms. Dutton for the information provided. We pay tribute to you, your work, and your teams on the ground and mourn the loss of all the 60 UN workers fallen in the line of duty. The past three weeks have been dramatic for Israelis and Palestinians and tormenting for the Middle East and many elsewhere. The overall death toll in civilian victims is frightening and unsustainable. We extend our condolences and deepest sympathy to the families of all victims, Israelis and Palestinians alike. Mr. President, 7th of October will remain a defining moment in the never quiet history of the Middle East. Hamas is brutality and terror. The worst in human behavior will not and must not be forgotten. In the current utterly complex situation, there is an accumulation of competing urgencies. The response to terror and the continued rocket launches from Gaza, the liberation of hostages, the protection of civilians, the provision of humanitarian help, and the increased risk of spillover of the conflict. Let me quickly go through each of them. First, in its exercise of the right of self-defense, which we recognize and support like for every other country under attack, Israel is determined to eradicate Hamas. It should not be portrayed mistakenly as a license to punish Palestinians. It is beyond any doubt that con conducting warfare in such a densely populated area as Gaza is difficult, challenging, very demanding, and it must be conducted prudently, professionally, and in compliance with international humanitarian law. We profoundly regret every innocent life lost without distinction. While circumstances may be different, a loss is always a loss. Therefore, there is need for maximum precaution not to harm those who are twice in danger, first from Hamas and their policies on one hand, and a fight they have not chosen on the other. It is therefore extremely important and urgent to do everything possible that civilian populations are not found in that hopeless place from where they, there is no escape. Second, nothing can ever justify abducting and holding hostages innocent people, children, women, and elderly, even less so using them as Hamas is doing. They must be liberated, they must be brought home. We welcome efforts from various actors in this respect and urge them to continue. Third, unhindered humanitarian help at scale must be urgently provided to all those in need. We cannot contemplate children dying in the hospitals because of the lack of medicine or electricity or water or lack of communications. We cannot contemplate lack of food for entire families, adding to an already difficult situation the total breakdown of law and order because of lack of basic commodities. The government of Israel has promised that soon aid will flow in abundance. It should happen immediately. Those who are spared from the fighting do not need to die from hunger. Colleagues, we try to put ourselves in Israel's shoes, feel the trauma of terror striking with a ferocity we cannot forget, faced with an, with an existential question with countries and proxies that seek openly to destroy it. I don't think anyone here or anywhere would feel at ease knowing that your next door neighbor is just waiting for the right moment to kill you. How can this not bring back horrible memories that fear and anxiety summarized in the Never Again Pledge. 
but we also put ourselves in the very same way, in the shoes of the Palestinians, feeling the unexplainable pain of civilians caught in the midst of a war that has befallen on them, a war first imposed by Hamas and the likes, decided elsewhere by their masters who are rubbing their hands in the face of casualties they had anticipated and hoped for in a turmoil of all dangers. We feel for Palestinians for who for decades, at every time they neared to the horizon of their future with their state, those against would always be quicker to disrupt it and push it further away. We feel for those thousands on both sides of this terrible divide who have lost their loved ones, the families of the hostages, and all those torn apart by death and grief and the insecurity of tomorrow. Wars are sometimes unavoidable because imposed, but they are always brutal. They bring inevitable destruction. They cause victims and sadly often casualties among those who don't deserve it. But even wars have laws and they must be respected. We believe and trust that there is a way, there, and there is and must be a way to ensure the security of Israel and its people while ensuring the security of and of and the perspective of all Palestinians who do not want war. Colleagues, beyond the tragedy unfolding in Israel and Gaza, the magnitude of the human suffering is impacting people across borders and identities. And we notice a sharp increase in the hate and division, including the threat of terrorism and targeted violence. This sharp and often confusing polarization fails to acknowledge our, human, our common humanity and that the killing of innocent civilians, regardless of religion or ethnic background, is wrong, unacceptable. The frightening images of the bloodthirsty mob yesterday in Dagestan hunting for Jewish people is another appalling illustration of intolerable and appalling rays of anti-Semitism. No one should stay indifferent to rallies, to allow rallies where people chant kill the Jews or destroy Israel. This is why there is so much need for wisdom responsibility and action on the ground and from this council. Because otherwise confusion, hatred, tension and violence will continue, not only in Gaza and the West Bank, but also elsewhere in the Middle East and beyond, dividing societies, fueled by strong emotions, ideologies and beliefs, overpowering cold minds and reason and overshadowing forward-looking perspectives. Last but not least, Mr. President, the serious risk of spillover. Hezbollah is playing with fire and attacks from the northern border are becoming more and more threatening. If this continues, it may be a matter of time before the irreparable point is reached. It must be resisted since it will only bring the region and all the countries involved near a catastrophe. In this respect, we are also very concerned for the situation in the West Bank. We condemn the extremist settler violence on Palestinians, which is totally unacceptable. Such acts must be fully investigated and those responsible must be held accountable. Mr. President, in the face of so much complexity and adversity, we think it is urgent to start thinking about the Gaza of tomorrow, the Gaza without Hamas, without extremists. There is need to offer Palestinian civilians in Gaza a perspective, a new organization of life under a new administration. Hamas has let them down. Hamas has brought war to them. Hamas did not bring them prosperity because it invested in tunnels and rockets, in hatred and death. We need to start thinking how the fabric of the society can be repaired so that the children know that what shalom means instead of being raised with and repeating death to the Jews. If not, the Hamas of today will only be replaced by the Hamas of tomorrow, maybe with another name, but with the same hatred, the same ideology, the same goals embroiled in a never-ending cycle of hurting the other acting falsely in the name of God they disrespect and acting falsely in the name of a future they simply oppose. This is why there is a need to revive the political process as soon as possible, because in its absence, there will only be unhappiness, poverty, discrimination, hatred, tension, never ending violence, victims, and, is, and as it has happened many times, exploitation by terrorist extremists and their supporters. And let's not fool ourselves the next war will be only deadlier. But it is preventable if we all work together with conviction and in good faith for peace, for lasting peace. And I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Albania and for his statement. And I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Mozambique.
Thank you, Mr. President. Mozambique thanks the Brazil presidents for timely convening this meeting. We also thank the briefers, Mr. Felipe Lazzarini, Commissioner General of United Nations Relief and the Workers Agents for Palestine Refugees in East, in East. Ms. Lisa Dothen, OSHA's Director of Humanitarian, Financial, and Resource Mobilization Division, and Mrs. Catherine Rossell, Director, Executive Director of United Nations Children Fund, for their insight and update on the current situation in the Gaza trip. Mr. President, a glue and tragic situation is taking place in Gaza. We are orphaned by the reports of suffering and death of children, women, and men in Gaza. It is clear that the protection of civilians in time of war is not being observed. In this context, Mozambique joins our voice with that of many others in reiterating an immediate and unconditional humanitarian ceasefire to ease the suffering of millions of our brothers and sisters, Israelis and Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Mr. President, we, wish, we should remind ourselves that the laws of war have established the clear rules to protect human lives, human dignity, and respect humanitarian needs. These laws cannot occur or settle under any circumstances. They must be respected and observed by everyone, everywhere, at all times, without exception or excuse. We have condemned attacks on Hamas on 7 October against the Israeli children, women, and men. We strongly condemn the attacks against the civilian populations, in particular children, women, elderly, and the humanitarian, UN humanitarian staff. We call on their protection. That is vital. It is therefore imperative that we continue working together towards ensuring the safety and protection of civilians in the conflict zone. The world looks at us as expert us as a member of this Security Council to respond expeditiously to the situation in the Gaza Strip. The United Nations awaits actions and leadership from this council. Article 24 of the UN Charter clearly states that, I quote, in order to ensure prompt and effective action by United Nations, it is members confer on the Security Council primary responsibility for maintenance of international peace and security, end of the court. Accordingly, we reiterate our appeal to members of this council to fulfill their functions and powers to change the course of actions in the Gaza Strip. Mozambique as a strong advocate for peace and dialogue in the Middle East region, particularly in Palestine. We echo the United Secretary General re repeated calls towards resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is the, is the key to st sustainable peace in the Middle East. For this desirable purpose, 
we firmly believe that the parties can work together through constructive dialogue for a lasting peace in full compliance with the principles of two-state solution based on Security Council and the General Assembly resolutions and decisions. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the permanent representative of Mozambique and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of the Russian Federation. <clears throat> Mr. President, distinguished Mr. Minister, we fully support the convening by the delegations of the UAE and China of this emergency meeting of the Security Council on the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. We were extremely concerned to hear the assessments of the situation on the ground from the Commissioner General of UNRWA, Filipe Lazzarini, UNICEF Executive Director Catherine Russell and OCHA Director Lisa Doughton. Colleagues, the time has come to call things by their names. On the occupied Palestinian territory, the West Bank of the Jordan River and the Gaza Strip, a humanitarian catastrophe of biblical proportions is unfolding. According to incoming information, the number of people killed in the enclave has exceeded 8,000, half of which are children, women and older persons. More than 2,000 people are buried under the rubble, half of which are also children. More than 21,000 people have been wounded. The number of internally displaced persons in Gaza has reached 1.6 million people. In UNRWA camps alone, there are 640,000 Palestinians. In the West Bank, more than 100 people have been killed and 3,000 have been injured. These chilling numbers are growing by the hour. We express our gratitude to all humanitarian workers on the ground that are working to exhaustion with uh, a catastrophic lack of basic, uh, including medical supplies, and also with an extremely high risk to their own lives. The scale of losses from UN agencies is shocking. 63 staff members have been killed, 22 have been injured, and 42 UNRWA objects have been destroyed and we pay tribute to the UN staff that continue to work in unimaginable conditions and to those that have paid for this with their lives. According to media reports, during Israeli shelling on the Blue Line, two peacekeepers from the UN Interim Force in Lebanon have been wounded. The largest hospital in Gaza, Al-Quds, is under the threat of attack from the IDF. The Israeli Air Force is launching strikes 50 meters from facilities, demanding immediate evacuation. Almost 640,000 IDPs have found refuge in 150 UNRWA sites across the Gaza Strip. As a result of the bombing, nine hospitals are ent entirely unusable, and the remaining ones are experiencing an acute lack of medicines. The blockade of the Gaza Strip has essentially become total. In the enclave, internet and mobile service has been switched off. It has been quite simply cut off from the rest of the world. Nobody knows accurately what is exactly happening there. This sort of blockade not only is sowing greater panic among the civilian population, it is directly undermining the work of medical and rescue services, uh, which means it is leading to more civilian casualties. For this reason, it was not possible to agree on the 28th of October for the passage of another humanitarian convoy across the Rafa crossing point. We categorically condemn these actions, particularly in a situation in which, after shutting off communications, the most powerful airstrikes were launched on the enclave since the beginning of this escalation. In the conditions of active hostilities, the humanitarian response remains essentially nominal. Through the Rafa crossing point, the only point uh, from Egypt, from the since the 21st of October, only 94 trucks have made it through. And according to incoming information, Israel is even stymieing these meager deliveries. As a result, in the Gaza Strip, there is an acute lack of everything, water, fuel, food, medicines, and people are frightened and have been driven to despair. On the 28th of October, according to, uh, upon the decision of the military political leadership of Israel, the armed forces of that country, ignoring the position clearly expressed by the international community in the Union General Assembly resolution adopted the previous day, began a ground operation in the Gaza Strip. After extremely intensive air strikes, the Israeli army began to enter the territory of the enclave from several directions, in the south near Burej refugee camp and Khan Yunus, and in the north near Beit Hanun. 
colleagues, the Israeli authorities have uh, different ways of describing their actions, expanding operations or preparing a bridgehead. But that's not the point. The point is that despite the unambiguous reaction around the world, West Jerusalem has begun the practical implementation of its plans to clear the enclave. In response, we have heard from the head of the Israeli Foreign Ministry saying that Israel rejects outright the UN's despicable call for a ceasefire, end quote. These comments uh, did not go unnoticed as well. The comments from the permanent representative of Israel saying that UN has lost its legitimacy. There are shocking statements from a number of representatives in the Knesset that have been broadly circulated in the media saying that, and I quote, there is no symmetry in the Israeli response and that, and I quote, the children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves, end quote. Unfortunately, this clearly shows that Israel is demonstratively ignoring the opinion of the overwhelming majority of UN members, including many Western states, regarding the need for an end to the violence. This uh, appalling situation has also been brought about because due to the US position, the Security Council has essentially been paralyzed and has still not been able to adopt a resolution with an immediate demand for a ceasefire. We have twice made attempts to do so, but Washington and Western Jerusalem have entirely other plans to wipe out the population of Gaza or to force them out of the Gaza Strip and to force the remaining Palestinian population to assimilate uh, into Israel so as to resolve the Palestinian problem that way. In the context of unprecedented, uh, the unprecedented scale of the escalation of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, we also have to note the current rise in tensions on the Syrian-Israeli border, which is linked to the active external interference coupled with the illegal military presence of the USA in the north and northeast of the Syrian Arab Republic. On the 26th of October, US forces, upon the instructions of President Joe Biden, launched strikes on two objects uh, in the Abu Kamal area in the east of Syria. Washington said that the attack was undertaken in ex exercise of their so-called right to self-defense, uh, American style. And uh, this is th uh, thousands of kilometers from US territory. These illegitimate and in no way justified actions by Washington are nothing other than a gross violation of Syria's sovereignty and the norms of international law. In the present circumstances, such an illegitimate use of force could have extremely dangerous consequences because it could provoke an armed escalation encompassing the entire region. Colleagues, the time for half measures and half-hearted glib appeals is past. No humanitarian pauses will help. Humanitarian assistance cannot be provided in the height of hostilities on the ground. I hope that everyone here understands that. The number of victims among the humanitarian workers is running into the dozens. Ambulances have been bombed and those that are left are unable to operate due to a lack of fuel. All noble humanitarian passages are, of course, important, but in and of themselves, they're not going to stop the war. The priority of the global community now is to stop the bloodshed, to minimize the harm to the civilian population, and to move the situation into the political diplomatic sphere. There must be a consolidation of collective efforts aimed at relaunching a fully-fledged negotiating process between Israelis and Palestinians with the aim of realizing the UN-endorsed two-state solution. Upon the basis of that, an independent Palestinian state should be created in the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, coexisting in peace and security with Israel. Mr. President, I would like to ask the permanent representative of the USA a question. Can you explain why you oppose a ceasefire? Does this mean that the USA, as a permanent member of the Security Council, uh, supports the doctrine of a massive retaliation in Gaza? Where is your compassion for civilians that you so eloquently express at every Security Council meeting on Ukraine? And that's even though the lives of civilians in Ukraine are far from facing the same level of threat as Palestinians in Gaza. Or is it that you only uh, think about what's, uh, those who are in the European continent and that Palestinian lives don't stir any emotions in Washington? And and I would like to put the same question to the other Western delegations in the Council who shamefully abstained on all of our draft resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Colleagues, your double standards are more than evident. The populations of your own countries are now calling for an answer to that, where there are mass demonstrations in support of Palestine. In this situation, the Russian Federation is making intensive efforts to de-escalate the situation on the ground, aimed at rapidly resolving the crisis. 
in all uh, we have sent a clear signal to all of the parties involved there must immediately be an end to the fighting and the ensuring of humanitarian corridors for the emergency provision of humanitarian as of assistance to all those who need it and president putin has been extremely clear we categorically will not accept and condemn any terrorist acts we express condolences to all those who have lost their loved ones in israel and in palestine and in other countries but while condemning terrorism and the taking of hostages and demanding their unconditional release. We categorically cannot agree that the threat of terrorism can be responded to while violating the norms of international humanitarian law, including the indiscriminate use of force on objects of civilian infrastructure where civilians are known to be located. And alongside addressing the urgent tasks to end the current escalation of violence, we must immediately begin to agree on a strategy for collective actions for a political settlement to the conflict. In the past, this was done by the quartet of international mediators. However, the USA has done everything to undermine this effective instrument. On the agenda is establishing a collective mediating mechanism with an active role for states in the region. This is supported by the positive trends that uh, before the previous uh, escalation, the current escalation in Gaza were evident in the Middle East. The Saudi-Iranian normalization, the reintegration of Syria into the League of Arab States, and the steady improvement in interstate relations between Syria and Turkey. All of this proves, and Turkey, excuse me, all of this proves that the countries in the region are, when they take the, country, the situation in hand, and are not subjected to pressure from outside the region, they can achieve a great deal to stabilize the Middle East. Given the growing escalation in the Palestinian enclave and the unthinkably vast uh, consequences for the civilian population, which is cut off from outside supplies, we believe it is important to hold regular open briefings such as the one today. The humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip without any discrimination must remain within the focus of our constant attention as uh, takes place in the context of other crises. Mr. President, some colleagues trying to shift the focus from the tragic events surrounding the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, touched upon the 29th of October incident in Mahachkala Airport in Dagestan in Russia. Exhaustive comments on this have already been provided by the Russian leadership and representatives of the regional authorities and the Muslim leadership. Assessing the actions will be provided by the Investigative Committee of Russia, which has, in, has launched criminal cases into this disorder. Dozens of people participating in this disorder have already been arrested and questioned. It's clear that any illegal actions are unacceptable. However, attempts to paint an unsanctioned action in the airport as an outbreak of uh, anti-Semitic uh, feeling in Russian society, particularly in the North Caucasus, is unacceptable. This region has long been an example of the peaceful and friendly coexistence of those from many different uh, peoples. In Russian society, unlike Western societies, the um, principles of uh, tolerance and religious and racial grounds are, are, are well rooted. In our society, there is the coexistence of the representatives of all of the main faiths, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and Buddhism. As is confirmed by data from the uh, Russian security services, the events in Mahachkala are clearly seen uh, uh, clearly show signs of external interference, including information uh, interference through social networks. And the traces of that, you will be n not surprised at all, come from Ukraine. Uh, some wish to abuse the situation and play on the feelings of Muslims in Russia by showing terrible pictures from the Gaza Strip, showing the horrors that are taking place there, the deaths of women, older persons, children, and medical workers. I would recommend that some of our colleagues do not try to shift the blame, but rather that they pay attention to the situation in their own capitals where there are many uh, Muslim demonstrations that uh, are, clear, are being brutally put down by the police. This is an example of Western countries' commitment to multiculturalism and freedom of expression. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of the Russian Federation for his statement, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of the United Kingdom. Thank you, President. I'd like to thank Commissioner General Lazzarini, Executive Director Russell, and Director Doughton for your stark and clear briefings. Let me start by recognizing the courage, commitment, and sacrifice of UN employees and humanitarian workers in Gaza, and in particular, 
the 103 aid workers, including the 64 UNRWA staff who have been killed in Gaza in the last 22 days. We also offer our sincere condolences to all Palestinians and Israelis who have suffered or lost loved ones. Since Hamas terrorist attack against Israel on the 7th of October, the United Kingdom has underscored Israel's right to self-defense against ter terrorism. We continue to be clear that this must be done in accordance with international humanitarian law. Our efforts with our international partners have focused on the protection of civilians. Securing and scaling up humanitarian access and the release of hostages. Sadly, despite these efforts, the situation in Gaza deteriorates daily. Hamas bears sole responsibility for starting this conflict. President, I'd like to highlight three priorities. First, we call on all parties to respect international humanitarian law, including the principles of proportionality, distinction, and necessity. This requires all parties to take every possible step to avoid the harming of civilians and the immediate and unconditional release of hostages. Second, we must urgently cooperate to scale up aid into Gaza and to ensure sufficient access points are open. For this to happen successfully, there needs to be a safer environment which necessitates humanitarian pauses. We support UN-led efforts in this regard. Since the latest escalation in Gaza, the UK has committed over $36 million in additional aid to the occupied Palestinian territories. An RAF flight arrived in Egypt on the 25th of October, carrying 21 tonnes of UK aid for Gaza. But the access environment needs to improve immediately so that these and other life-saving resources can reach the people who desperately need them. Third, we cannot allow this conflict to spread. We call on all countries in the region to help avoid escalation and warn non-state actors not to exploit the current situation. President, the Palestinian Authority has a key role as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. We call on Israel and other states to support the PA. We call on Israeli authorities to tackle the rising number of settler attacks and killings in the occupied West Bank, recalling that it is their responsibility to protect Palestinian civilians there. The UK retains the long-term goal of a two-state solution with Israel and Palestine coexisting peacefully. To reach that goal, we have a responsibility to ensure a plan for Gaza that offers the population hope, security, stability, prosperity, and effective governance so that their political wishes can be fulfilled. In this regard, some fundamental principles apply. There should be no mass displacement of Gazans to neighboring countries. The Palestinian Authority should play a central role and nothing should be done that cuts across progress towards a two-state solution with Gaza as an integral part of a Palestinian state. Thank you, President.
I thank the permanent representative of the United Kingdom for her statement, and I now give the floor to the permanent representative of Japan. I thank uh, Commissioner General Philip Lazzarini and UNICEF Executive Director Catherine Russell and OCHA Director Lisa Dalton for your briefings. I join other colleagues in expressing our respect to all humanitarian actors who are tirelessly working under unimaginable conditions. Mr. President, since October 7th, thousands of people have been killed and wounded. The tragic sequence of events shows no signs of abating, descending further into a devastating cycle with unimaginable losses of life and the destruction of civilian facilities. Just recently, Israel announced the expansion of its ground operations in Gaza. Japan has been paying careful attention to the situation with grave concern. Japan has expressed unequivocal con uh, condemnation to the terror attacks committed by Hamas and other militants and extends its sincere condolences to all victims. We demand the immediate and unconditional release of the remaining hostages. The international community should never tolerate such a heinous act. Hamas does not speak for the Palestinian people. Every member state has the right to defend itself and its people in accordance with international law. At the same time, all parties must act based on international law. The deterioration of the situation in Gaza has led to a deepened humanitarian crisis to an unprecedented level of severity. Lo the loss of any more innocent lives, regardless of their nationalities, religions, or ethnicities, is simply unacceptable. No one's life is more important or less important than that of others. Full, rapid, safe, and unhindered humanitarian access, consistent with international humanitarian law, must be allowed in order to alleviate the devastating humanitarian situation. While several trucks have crossed through the Rafah crossing, hundreds more must follow suit to meet the dire need of over two million people. And in this context, we should also take further steps immediately, including humanitarian pauses and establishment of humanitarian corridors. Additionally, we express a profound concern regarding the disconnection of te telecommunications networks, which disrupts vital communication channels between those in Gaza and the rest of the world, and also impedes the work of media and humanitarian communities. It is especially imperative to ensure these networks function, networks function to ensure the delivery of humanitarian assistance and the safety of humanitarian workers. As the situation is rapidly evolving, it is critical for all parties in the region to avoid exacerbating this conflict. The international community has a duty to redouble its diplomatic efforts in order to prevent the instability from spilling over into the region and to calm the situation with a sense of urgency. The Security Council needs to act urgently to find a common ground among all Council members to deliver a meaningful message and help to all parties, to all in dist distress. While we remain unable to act, lives are being lost day by day, minute by minute. We must also recall that Ultimately, there is no alternative to a two-state solution. All parties must make serious efforts to this end. I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Japan for his statement, and I give the floor to the permanent representative of Ghana. Mr. President, I thank you for giving me the floor. And let me begin by thanking Commissioner General Lazzarini, Executive Director Russell, and Director Dalton for their briefings on the worsening humanitarian situation in Gaza following the resurgence of conflict in the Middle East after the heinous terrorist attacks by Hamas against Israel on 7th of October. 23 days after the attacks in southern Israel with the attendant loss of lives and abductions, we are appalled by the many lives that are being lost in the ensuing conflict as well as its humanitarian consequences. We are equally concerned by the potential spread of the conflict to the wider region 
and the heavy toll that it bodes for innocent civilian populations. Last Friday, within the context of the resumed 10th emergency special session of the General Assembly, majority of the members of this organization, through the residual rule of the Assembly, called for an immediate, durable, and sustained humanitarian truce, demanded of all parties to comply with their obligations under international humanitarian law, and asserted the needs for continuous, sufficient, and unhindered provision of essential supplies and services into the Gaza Strip. It also called for the immediate and unconditional release of all civilians held captive and demanded their safety, well-being, and humane treatment in compliance with international law. Taking into account what the Assembly has said, we must, as a council, build upon the convergence of views on this crisis to support the Secretary General, UN agencies, and staff, including ANWA, to deliver critical care and support services to the nearly 672,000 internally displaced persons sheltering in the 149 ANWA facilities, as well as the many other innocent civilians who are living under desperate conditions. From recent reports of ANWA, the number of trucks that are allowed into Gaza will need to be scaled up significantly if we are to make any impact in addressing the desperate humanitarian needs of the two million people in Gaza, especially in the health and food security components and the supporting supply needs. In this context, we appeal to Israel, Egypt, and other stakeholders to work constructively towards enhanced humanitarian access through the Rafah border crossing, and to all donors to step up financial and material contributions to ANWA to meet the growing and urgent humanitarian needs of the people of Gaza. We must also use the weight of the Assembly's decision to strenuously encourage the efforts of leaders in the region, especially Qatar, as well as the ICRC, that have been at the forefront of negotiations to secure the release of all Israeli and foreign hostages, to impress upon the Hamas militia, to heed the demand of the international community for the immediate and unconditional release of all captured civilians. Holding innocent civilian populations as captives is wrong and unacceptable, regardless of the motives. Mr. President, the past 23 days has also been one of blood, pain, and anguish, as we have not seen in the region in recent times. Not to make further efforts to stop the fighting would be truly tragic. We encourage regional and international leaders to act as moderating influence on the parties, to help de-escalate the conflict, and prevent its further spread in the region. The impact of the conflict on women, children, and the elderly has been enormous, and we owe it to them on both sides to bring this crisis to an end. In concluding, we reiterate our condolences for all lives lost and remind the Palestinian and the Israeli people of their interwoven history and shared geography, both ancient and modern. The experiences of the past should reinforce the realization that violence cannot be the tool for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Indeed, neither the security interest of Israel nor the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people for their homeland can be secured by violence. For Ghana, and as often repeated, we hold the view that a deepened commitment to a negotiated two-state solution on the basis of the 1967 borders offers the best prospects for peace and stability in the Middle East. We hope that in furtherance of this council's responsibilities, we can find a consensus to end this conflict, bring the parties to the table of dialogue, and help deliver a secure and assured statehood for both Israel and Palestine sooner rather than later. I thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Ghana for his statement. The representative of the United States has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give them the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my apologies for taking the floor, but I need to respond to some comments made by uh, the uh, Russian permanent representative. Uh, since the beginning of this conflict, uh, the Russian Federation has spared no uh, moment trying to either directly or indirectly blame the United States for uh, this crisis. Um, it is irresponsible. Um, it is false that we have, uh, we are responsible in some way for what is going on. No one has worked, no state has worked harder than the United States 
to try to resolve this situation, and we continue to work hard uh, to do so. This is a typical Russian narrative um, that has, again, no basis in fact. Um, Russia, frankly, has no credibility. Um, its prevarication knows no bounds. Um, it claims to care about the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Uh, I, I think it's pretty clear. Russia doesn't care about solving crises, humanitarian crises. It creates them. If you have any doubts, just look what's going on in Ukraine. Regarding U.S. actions in, in Syria, uh, we responded to attacks against U.S. personnel acting in self-defense under Article 51 of the U.N. Charter. I think Russia will recall the U.N. Charter. It has been working to drive a stake through the heart of this sacred document, through everything that's been doing uh, in Ukraine. So let me just close by saying, Mr. President, the United States will continue its efforts to do what it can to ease the situation um, in the region. And my hope is that Russia will step up and be a responsible player in the Security Council and work with the international community to try to bring about uh, an end uh, to uh, this very, very sad situation. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of the United States for the statement. The permanent representative of the Russian Federation has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give him the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll be brief. And taking stock of the latest comment from my American colleague as an admittance, uh, we didn't hear a response to the question that we put to him, but I would like to put a rhetorical question to him, which I don't require an answer to because it's a rhetorical question and the answer is, is obvious anyway. How many times uh, during the present uh, crisis has the United States initiated a meeting on the humanitarian situation in Gaza? Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of the Russian Federation for his statement. I now give the floor to the permanent observer of the observer state of Palestine. Mr. President, <clears throat> I want to begin by welcoming you to this chamber and to leading the deliberation of this emergency meeting requested by our colleagues from United Arab Emirates and China, which we appreciate. The fact that you are with us for the third time during this month is an illustration of the commitment of Brazil at the level of the foreign minister, and I am sure with the urgency from President Lula to do everything that you can in order to bring about the end of this carnage and the tragedy that the Palestinian people are going through, particularly in the Gaza Strip. We, the Palestinian people and the state of Palestine, and our people everywhere, particularly in the Gaza Strip and our leadership, do really appreciate this commitment, this effort that Brazil is doing. And I am personally delighted to see you for the third time because I consider you as a good friend from the time when we worked together as permanent representatives of our states. I want also to thank the three briefers, Commissioner General Lazzarini, Executive uh, uh, Director, uh, Ms. Russell, and Director, Ms. Doughton, for their briefings and the, for their moving calls. And it is coming from people who are in the field leading teams in the field trying to save lives of the Palestinian people. 
we don't only express our gratitude and appreciation for what they do and also receive with them accepting condolences for those who have lost their lives and paid the ultimate price for trying to save the life of the Palestinian people. They are the best faces of the United Nations. They are the best among us, led by a hero by the name of Guterres, who stood outside the Rafah uh, crossing and made his brave humanitarian call, have a peaceful ceasefire, allow humanitarian convoys to reach everywhere in the Gaza Strip to save lives, to put an end to this war, and to save hospitals, to save every institution that is providing life for our people. Those are the best faces of the United Nations. And if they are in fact the best faces, which we truly believe and we express our gratitude to them, I believe we have to listen to everything they, that they have said and to listen to their important call and requests, humanitarian ceasefire and humanitarian convoys up to scale as the Secretary General requested of a minimum of 100 truckloads every day. If we genuinely respect their calls and what they are doing, let us not only listen closely to them, but to implement their request. And with that spirit, allow me, Mr. President, to deliver my statement. Mr. President, Doug Hammarskjöld said, and I quote, the United Nations was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but to save us from hell, end of quotation. Gaza is now hell on earth. You've heard that not from me. You've heard it from Lazzarini and many others. Gaza is now hell on earth. Saving humanity from hell today means for the United Nations to save Palestinians in Gaza. The 2.3 million Palestinians living there are enduring suffering that no human beings should endure. They are besieged and bombed with nowhere safe to go. Again, you heard Lazzarini. He said there is no safe place in the Gaza Strip. Half the homes in Gaza have been destroyed or damaged. Gaza population is comprised of 70% of refugees. Over 1.4 million Palestinians have been forcibly displaced from their homes. Again, Mr. Lazzarini. Now, virtually all of our people in Gaza are homeless displaced, moving from one family home to another, from a hospital to a church, from a mosque to an honorable school, sleeping in their cars, sleeping in the streets, and still being killed wherever they go to convince them they will not be safe anywhere in Gaza. A leaked document prepared by the Israeli Intel Ministry, Intelligence Ministry, confirms that, in fact, relo relocating Palestinians from Gaza to 10 cities in Sinai is not a threat we imagined, but a reality, a reality Israel is trying to impose. They want do to depopulate the Gaza Strip completely from the entire population and throw them in the lap of Egypt in the Sinai Desert. Over 8,000 Palestinians have been killed, including over 3,000 in the south of Gaza, where Israel has pushed 
forcibly transferred hundreds of thousands of people. These staggering figures keep rising with every minute that action is delayed to stop the onslaught against our people. One figure more than any other explains the magnitude of this man-made tragedy. 3,500 Palestinian children have been killed by Israel in just three weeks. More than the annual number of children killed across the world's conflict zones since 2019, according to Save the Children, as my sister, the uh, minister from United Arab Emirates, Her Excellency Lana, has alluded to. Let me repeat, 3,500 Palestinian children have been killed by Israel in just three weeks, more than the annual number of children killed across the world's conflict zones combined since 2019. Every five minutes, a Palestinian child is killed. How many more days will you wait to say enough? How many more days will you wait to say enough? Paralyzed, not acting, not carrying out your duty to maintain international peace and security and to stop that war as a derivative of that. To recognize this is a war against our children. How long will it take you to recognize that thousands of, ch of children being killed before your own eyes, and you're still paralyzed. Our children, our children who are like yours, children of God, children of light, the angels on earth, enough darkness, enough death, save lives of our children and all children and the children of others. Mr. President, the General Assembly representing the countries of the world adopted a resolution grounded in humanity, morality, legality, and the rejection of double standards and of any, ju of any justification for the killing of innocent civilians, the siege against them, their captivity and their forced transfer. It took a stand that we will not forsake humanity. We will not forfeit international law. The General Assembly acted. The Secretary General acted. The army of, hum of his humanitarian agencies and the heroes leading them and those who are working in implementing that message, acted. And there is one important body still not acting. It is you. The General Assembly called for an immediate, durable, and sustained humanitarian truce. This must happen immediately. It stressed that humanitarian aid and access cannot be further delayed or obstructed and must be at levels that correspond to the immense needs created by this inhumane Israeli siege and the indiscriminate attacks it is perpetrate, perpetrating as we speak. Thousands more lives hang in the, in the balance. This resolution moral one, powerful one, in which 11 of you members of the Security Council voted for. Three of you abstained. One voted no. This resolution must be immediately and fully implemented. If you were able to vote in the General Assembly, what is stopping you from voting here? The 11 who voted yes, the three who abstained, among them four permanent members, 
voted yes and one abstention. Do what the bigger body is doing. Rise up to your responsibility and what you should do instead of dragging the paralysis, I don't know for how long, while thousands of Palestinian innocent civilians, including children, being slaughtered. The Security Council must take example on the, of the General Assembly and its wisdom and uphold its responsibilities to put an end to this bloodshed, which constitute an affront to humanity, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, and a clear and imminent danger for regional and international peace and security. I want to thank the Arab group led by my brother, Ambassador Mahmoud of Jordan, who has demonstrated an outstanding leadership in leading our group during this very difficult month. And we salute him and the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan and its foreign minister who was with us participating in what we've accomplished together with all of you, with many of you in the General Assembly. And the OIC member states for their relentless mobilization the countries of the Global South for their support as well as all the countries which engaged constructively and responsibly to allow us to adopt a substantive humanitarian resolution with overwhelming support from across the globe. 121 countries versus 14. Given that, 11 members of this council have voted in favor of the resolution that three abstained and one voted against. It is clear that the text enjoys broad support and must serve as basis for a clear and unequivocal position of the council at this critical juncture. Mr. President, 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza face death every day and every night. Save them. Save them. Look at them as human beings. You cannot look only at one side and ignore this tragic humanity completely. Wake up from, uh, from revenge. Look at us as human beings. Save them. We have 2,000 people under the rubble. Allow us to find them. Save those who still can be saved. And bury in a dignified manner those who have perished. Allow the 20,000 wounded to be properly treated. Allow doctors to fix broken bodies and God to heal wounded souls. Allow humanitarian workers, the brave ones, the heroes, to perform their life-saving duties, even as they mourn their colleagues. 64 alone among UNRWA as staff killed in Israeli attacks. Allow them to conduct their sacred mission in safety and not under the bombs. Allow hospitals to resume their work to save lives and not be transformed into morgues. Allow members of the same families who have survived, who, who have survived to embrace each other and to mourn their loved ones who did not. Allow us to pay the tribute owed to the families wiped off the face of this earth and whose names join the long list of bereaved families etched in our collective memory. Allow people who will have homes standing to go home and allow millions of people to start thinking once more about how to rebuild their lives 
despite the depths of the death, devastation, and destruction they endured, despite the indelible traumas. Treat us as human beings with the respect we deserve. We are not subhuman beings. We are not from another planet. We are exactly like each and every one of you. We are humans, human beings. Treat us in this manner with respect we deserve. Show respect for our inherent dignity, not in words, but in deeds, in action, in doing something to stop this crime against our people and our children and our women and our wounded and our sick. No one should justify our killing or find reasons to give more time to the killer. Call for an end of this assault on an entire nation. Stop the killings in the West Bank by settlers and occupation forces and the forced displacement underway there. Palestinians, as human beings, have rights that must be upheld and they are entitled to protection and we are entitled to be defended. Many of you talk about one narrative, about one state to defend itself. When our children are being killed, do we have the right to defend them? Do we have the right to defend our families? Do we have the right to defend our schools? Do we have the right to defend our mosques? Do we have the right to defend our churches? Do we have the right to defend our homes and our soil and our nation? Do we have rights? Or rights only the monopoly of one side? Our people have, as a people, rights that have long been denied and must now be recognized so we can all live in peace and security. No assault or war will ever end this conflict or resolve this injustice. It will only deepen and widen it. We have said time and time again there is no military solution to this conflict. We are yet to, de to demonstrate there is a peaceful one. And I listen to you all the time. And you tell me about the two-state solution. And you repeat it. And you repeat it. And you repeat it. But you don't tell me what single step you are willing to take in order to stop the other side from destroying the two-state solution before your eyes. Isn't it enough to wake up and say the resolution that you adopted that calls for the implementation of the two-state solution show resolve to implement these resolutions? You are the Security Council. Are you continuing to be paralyzed or you want to act on the advice you're giving me, you're giving the Palestinian people. Two-state solution we accepted, implement it. Who is stopping you from implementing it? Who is stopping you from uh, taking steps in order to push the occupation to an end, to allow for the independence of the state of Palestine? Who is stopping you? Don't keep repeating to me two-state solution. Tell me how you are going to defend it and how you are going to implement it. So that can our people believe you and have faith in what you are saying and respect what you call for when they see you marching toward the implementation. And whoever is standing on the path of the implementation of your will should be removed from the way so that we can see the implementation of the two-state solution.
based on your resolutions, based on international law, based on the terms of reference. You agreed into all these things, but you're not acting. You keep repeating them. And you think by repeating them, you did your duty. No, you have to do more. You have to take the practical steps for allowing the two-state solution to become a reality. We have said time and time again, I repeat, there is no military solution to this conflict. We are yet to demonstrate there is a peaceful one. Prove us wrong. Every minute counts. Every minute is the difference between life and death for Palestinians in Gaza. And I thank you very much, Mr. President, and I hope that there is a short period of time till the end of this, uh, your presidency. But if by uh, any miracle that you can have a position from the Security Council to stop this war and to allow the hundreds of trucks with humanitarian assistance to enter the Gaza Strip, we will tip our hat to you and to the Security Council members. And I thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank the permanent observer of the observer state of Palestine, Palestine for his statement. And I now give the floor to the representative of the state of Israel. Thank you, Mr. President. Distinguished council members, my grandfather, Chaim, was a farmer. He lived in a small village in Transylvania with his wife, Bracha, and their eight beautiful children. But in the spring of 1944, the small village ceased to exist. Their community was erased. The Nazis forced Chaim, Bracha, and their children, eight children, onto cattle cars hurtling towards Auschwitz. Upon arrival, Bracha and seven of their children, Pearl, Tzvi, Sarah, Hodaya, Leah, Henya, and little baby Mordechai, were murdered in the gas chambers and turned to ash. My grandfather's story was once a horror story of a different era, of a distant time of unfathomable hatred, a time which, until three weeks ago, we referred to as never again. Yet, never again happened again. The villages in southern Israel that were invaded by Hamas terrorists were peaceful agricultural villages just like my grandfather's village in Transylvania. Entire communities were exterminated. Only this time, the murderers were Hamas Nazis. Entire Israeli families were turned into smoke and ash, no different than the fate that my grandfather's family met in Auschwitz. But the brutality of the crimes is not the only thing that the savage Hamas Nazis share with the German Nazis. They both share a common ideology, and it's not the two-state solution. The Einsatzgruppen Nazi death squads were committed to exterminating the Jews, just as the Nuchba Hamas terrorists are committed to exterminating the Jews and Israel. The Nazis sought a Judenrein, Jew-free Europe, just as Hamas seeks a Judenrein Israel. Hamas are modern-day Nazis, from their appalling, inhumane violence to identical genocidal ideologies. Hamas is not seeking a solution to the conflict. They are not interested in dialogue. The only solution Hamas is interested in is the final solution, the annihilation of the Jewish people. And may I remind my colleague, they are the rulers of Gaza, not you. Yet Ismail Haniya, the leader of Hamas, is no Adolf Hitler. He is not the Führer. He is not the leader of this genocidal death cult hell bent on world domination. That role, dear colleagues, 
and you know it very well, is held by the supreme leader of Iran, the bloodthirsty Ayatollah Khamenei. Hitler's Third Reich was envisioned to be a thousand-year empire stretching across continents, just as Khamenei envisions his radical Shiite hegemony to stretch across the region and beyond. The Ayatollah regime is the modern Nazi regime, and their death squads include Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Houthis, the Revolutionary Guard, and other savage jihadists. Instead of shouting, Sieg Heil, these radical Nazi Islamists scream, death to Israel, death to America, death to England. You could see it on the Khamenei's Twitter account. Just like the Nazi regime, the Ayatollah regime saw death and destruction everywhere it touches. Just as the French under the Vichy or the Italian under Mussolini, the residents of Gaza, Lebanon, Yemen, and Syria are enduring indescribable bloodshed and terror at the hands of Iran's jihadist Nazi forces. Like the suffering of Lond Londoners during the Blitzkrieg, Ukrainian civilians are being murdered from the skies with Iranian Nazi weaponry. Like the ever-reaching hand of the Wehrmacht, the Houthi Iranian proxy attacked Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and Albania was struck by unprovoked Iranian cyber attacks. The Islamic Nazi regime of Iran is responsible for aiding terrorists around the globe and working towards destroying every value our civilized world holds dear. Today, the world is watching the rise of a Shia Islamic, Islamist Reich. Yet, just like the rise of Nazism, the world is silent. Definitely silent. Even if you continue calling this meeting the situation in the Middle East and the Palestinian question, for the rest of time, it will not make it any truer. This meeting is only about the situation in the Middle East and the Iranian threat. This has nothing to do with the Palestinians. Three weeks ago, humanity witnessed Iran's Hamas death squads in action. Like Babi Yar, they exterminated Jews in the hundreds like they were insects. Hamas Nazis deliberately sliced open the pregnant belly of a woman, removed her fetus, and stabbed it before its mother's eyes while she was still alive. But even so, the Security Council still has not condemned Hamas for, for the intentional murder of Israeli civilians. Unbelievable. Over 250,000 innocent Israeli civilians have been displaced since the war began. Millions of Israelis are living every day under constant indiscriminate rocket fire, both in the south and the north, at the hands of Hamas, Hezbollah, and other jihadists. Does this council not have anything to say about this? Is this not also part of the situation in the Middle East? Council members, when my grandfather Chaim and his children were sent to Auschwitz, the world stayed silent. When his babies were sent to the gas chambers, the world stayed silent. When their bodies were burned along millions of other Jewish children, not only Jewish, the world was silent. Today, after innocent Jewish babies were burned alive, this council is still silent. Some member states have learned nothing in the past 80 years. Some of you have forgotten why this body was established. So I will remind you, from this day on, each time you look at me, you will remember what staying silent in the face of evil means. Just like my grandparents and the grandparents of millions of Jews, from now on, my team and I will wear yellow stars.
We will wear this star until you condemn the atrocities of Hamas and demand the immediate release of our hostages. We walk with a yellow star as a symbol of pride, a reminder that we swore to fight back to defend ourselves. Never again is now. Council members, in the face of the UN's silence, our enemies have become emboldened. They have seen the UN General Assembly applauding efforts to prevent the Jews from defending ourselves. They heard the Secretary General portray understanding for the Nazi slaughter. slaughter. And this is precisely why we have seen the most staggering rise in Jew hatred since the Nuremberg Laws and their aftermath. The anti-Semites have been empowered. They now know that slaughtering Jews in their beds is met with silence. They have been so galvanized by this organization's inaction that they cannot wait to butcher Jews themselves. Calls for gassing the Jews are heard in Sydney. Chants for a Judenrein Palestine from the river to the sea can be heard from California to New York. Islamist battle cries against Jews are being screamed in London, Brussels, and Paris. An airport in Dagestan, Russia, was flooded yesterday by Islamist terror supporters who, who searched for Jews to lynch. This is precisely where the world stood as the Nazi began their rampage. Precisely the same moment. And then, too, the world was silent. Understand where we are right now. Comprehend the weight of this moment. Internalize that the words stand at the crossroad just as it, did, as it did in the 1930s. Would this council take the approach of Chamberlain, appease the Nazis and their sympathizers, or will this council take the approach of Churchill to fight evil with blood, toil, tears, and sweat? Israel has made its choice. We were attacked by the Hamas Nazis. We were shown that genocidal Jew hatred did not die with Hitler. It bubbled and grew until it invaded our homeland. But the difference between 1939 and today is that today Jews have a strong state and a powerful military. We are not defenseless. We are lions of Judah and we will defend ourselves against those that seek to annihilate us. In the days leading up, up to and following the October 7th massacre, Simchat Torah massacre, the Führer Khamenei continued to spread his poisonous genocidal ideologies with the world. He tweeted about the end of Israel. He said that whoever normalizes relations with Israel would lose. He claimed that Israel is dying, and on the day of the massacre, he called for the eradication of Israel alongside a video of Israelis running for their lives as his Hamas Einsatzgruppen mowed them down with machine guns. Colleagues, if Hitler had a Twitter account, it would look exactly the same as Khamenei's. Exactly. Shockingly, despite the blatant genocidal Nazism of the Islamist, Islamic Reich of Iran, the Secretary General and UN officials, who are being applauded here, are still meeting with Iranian officials without saying one word of condemnation for their support of genocide. What a disgrace. The Secretary General rolled out the red carpet for the Iranian Nazi foreign minister, here in this very building last week, smiling and shaking his blood-soaked hand. Secretary Gutierrez, aside from empty words paid as lip service for media purposes, has not publicly demanded even once that ISIS Hamas terrorists allow the, allow the Red Cross to at the very least verify some sign of life of the hostages to condition that without such a step, Hamas will be held accountable for the humanitarian situation in Gaza. How can this be? Why are the humanitarian needs of Gazans the sole issue? The sole issue. 
you are all focused on. Is this not the bare minimum that must be called for from these monsters? Where is this council's voice as a council? Hamas Nazis have spent the, the, the past 16 years ruling Gaza, 16 years abusing Palestinians and butchering anyone who opposed them, opposes them. When Hamas took power in Gaza in 2007, you all know it very well, they murdered hundreds of Palestinians with their own hands. They threw them off rough rooftops. They used Palestinians as human shields, building terror bases under hospitals and missile launchers next to schools. What do you expect us to do? They hoard medical supplies, food and fuel for themselves when these resources could benefit their people. I assume Lazzarini forgot to tell you about it. They also uh, deleted the tweet that was telling you about it. Their leaders live in luxury in Doha and Istanbul. They don't, live in li they don't even live in the Gaza Strip, their leaders, as their people live in poverty. Hamas ISIS terrorists are operating inside and under hospitals, including Shifa Hospital, which houses their command center. I reiterate it. Hamas is preventing Gazans from leaving an active war zone by heading south. Hamas is holding roughly half a million liters of fuel right now as we speak, next to Rafa crossing. Everything can be checked. In any discussion about lack of fuel, your demands should be directed at Hamas. Israel has approved dozens of daily, more than dozens, of daily trucks of humanitarian supplies, including food, water, and medical equipment. But Israel refuses to supply the enemy, Hamas, with any aid in accordance with international law. Hamas is the root cause of the situation in Gaza. Yet, you continue to insist on calling this meeting a discussion of the Palestinian question? Can anyone here provide a solution to the Palestinian question as long as Hamas controls Gaza? Calling for an immediate ceasefire is ultimately asking to tie Israel's hands and keep Hamas's rule in Gaza. Is this the future that you want for the people of Gaza? I'm sorry to say, but should this council have existed on June 6th, 1944, it would be in, in, intensely debating how much electricity and fuel the citizens of Munich had as the, as the Allies approached the shores of Normandy. This council would be fixated on debating the death toll of Germans versus British casualties. This council would be calling for a ceasefire before the Russians retook Stalingrad. We all know Hamas's intentions. And we all know that should they be given another chance, they will commit such atrocities again over and over and over, but this time on a much larger scale. Yet this organization, founded in the wake of the Holocaust, fails to act on its founding principles. Calling for a ceasefire is no different than calling off D-Day in 1944. Dear colleagues, Israel will no longer live with brutal Hamas Nazis on her border. We will not have savage ISIS Hamas death squads invading our homeland again. Israel's operation in Gaza is not, I reiterate, is not a response to October 7th. It is an act of self-defense to ensure our future. Mr. President, the Israeli people are strong. We are unbreakable, and we are going nowhere. Many, many have tried to destroy us, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Nazis, to name just a few. But none have succeeded, and the Iranian Reich will be no different. Israel will prevail, God willing. We will bring our hostages home, and the citizens of the Jewish state will live in peace and freedom. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the permanent representative of the State of Israel for his statement. And now I give the floor to the permanent representative of Jordan. 
Thank you, Excellency. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God Almighty, Mr. President, uh, I would like to thank Mr. Philippe Lazzarini, the Commissioner General of UNRWA. I thank Ms. Catherine Russell, the Executive Director of UNICEF, and Ms. Lisa Dotton, Director from OCHA. I am pleased to make the statement on behalf of uh, the Arab Group in New York. We address the Council today in this emergency session after the members of the General Assembly of the United Nations have voted to adopt a resolution as part of the 10th emergency session of the General Assembly on the Israeli illegal actions in East Jerusalem and the occupied Palestinian territory that Jordan co-sponsored as the chair of the Arab group for October. Mr. President, the Arab group and the OIC have submitted a request to the PGA to resume the GA 10th emergency special session after it has been very evident that the Security Council since the start of the war in October have not been able to shoulder its responsibility towards the maintenance of international peace and security and stop the war against our people in Gaza. Mr. President, the adoption by the GA of this resolution has sent a clear message that the international community has stood with justice and the protection of innocent civilians and adherence to legal, humanitarian, and legitimate uh, obligations um, and with the immediate stop of the raging Israeli war against Gaza, ending war crimes and the killing of defenseless innocent civilians and ending the destruction of homes, civil facilities, hospitals, houses of worship and infrastructure. And if this resolution is biased towards anything or anyone, it is biased towards justice, humanity and right. We were able to address a number of attempts to politicize this resolution. Mr. President, the General Assembly resolution includes a number of elements that need to be provided so that we can find a horizon to ending this war. One, call for an immediate, durable, and sustained humanitarian truce leading to a cessation of hostilities immediately. And the protection of all humanitarian civil facilities, including hospitals and houses of worship. Two, demands that all parties comply with their obligations under international law, including international humanitarian law. Three, provision of humanitarian assistance, including supplies and basic services to all civilians that need them in the Gaza Strip. Four, firmly rejecting any attempt at the forced transfer of the Palestinian civilian population and the call for the immediate and unconditional release of all civilians who are being illegally held captive. Mr. President, the Arab group calls that the international community make effort to bring pressure to bear on Israel decisively to stop stalling vis-a-vis -vis the entrance of assistance so that it would be provided in adequate quantities immediately to address the deteriorating humanitarian situation in Gaza. Here we would like to say that the number of trucks that accessed the Gaza Strip since the beginning of the war through the Rafah crossing is no more than 85 trucks compared to more than 500 trucks that used to daily enter the Gaza Strip before the war. This is as a result of Israel obstructing these trucks. Here, we stress that the Arab Republic of Egypt has not spared any effort to ensure the expeditious delivery of aid and humanitarian assistance to the brothers and sisters in Gaza, despite the operational and logistical obstacles by Israel in the way of access for political considerations and false security pretexts and Israel's continued threatening to shell the Rafah crossing. 
Mr. President, the continuation of the raging Israeli war against Gaza and the ensuing humanitarian disaster threatens a spillover effect into the region. Here, we warn against this uh, impact and its repercussions on the security and stability of the region and the whole world. Here, we call for a cessation of Israeli aggression on, uh, on um, Syrian territory and a cessation on the Lebanese borders and a cessation of Israeli violations on uh, villages in the south of Lebanon that has led to the displacement of 30,000 Lebanese and has killed more than 50 individuals in addition to targeting, directly targeting the centers of the Lebanese armed forces and UNIFIL and the killing of journalists. Mr. President, the war on Gaza is in a new phase, bringing more destruction, killing and oppression against the people of Gaza. Way more than what we have seen in the past few days. And when uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Jordan, Mr. Safadi, when he spoke at the Council last Tuesday, the total number of casualties of uh, Palestinian civilians was six thousand martyrs. Today, less than a week after that, the number of victims is 8,300 martyrs, including more than 3,400 children and 2,100 women, in addition to more than 2,000 individuals under the rubble for so many days now. The killing will not stop as long as Israel hears from some justifications for its crimes. It is given coverage, protection, without any accountability, unfortunately. As long as this cover-up continues, as long as silence on its actions continues, Israel will be emboldened and will continue to commit such acts in total impunity. Mr. President, isn't it time for human conscience uh, to wake up uh, to the scenes that we watch every day, every minute, uh, every hour, carnage, destruction in Gaza? Isn't it time for this council to heed the cries for help from the people of Gaza? They have no safe place to go to, to shelter from the Israeli bombardment and its destruction. Their homes, their hospitals, and their houses of worship have come down tumbling on their heads while they're inside, and even UN facilities have been also shelled. 1.4 million of the people of Gaza have left their homes and their neighborhoods. This deafening silence needs to stop. Isn't it time for the council to heed the calls of human conscience? And we thank the Secretary General for his words, despite all the attacks that he unfairly is uh, at the receiving end of uh, when he calls for a ceasefire and the delivery of uh, medical and humanitarian aids and the respect of international law and the protection of civilians and UN aid agencies. I don't know why is he being attacked for these positions, these fair positions of His Excellency the Secretary General. Isn't it time for your council to give prevalence to the principles of justice and, and humanity and to say to Israel that this transfer is a crime that cannot uh, be overlooked? The choice, either you die in the north of Gaza or be transferred to the south of Gaza to be also killed over there, this should be, shouldn't be a choice. The Council should not accept this. Isn't it time for the Council to say to Israel that human life is sacred regardless of someone's religion, ethnicity, or origin? Isn't it time to protect uh, UN facilities and the hospitals and infrastructure and facilities of Gaza? Isn't it time for the Council to heed the calls of humanitarian agencies 
that uh, Mr. Lazzarini and Ms. Russell and Ms. Dutton have uh, so clearly um, communicated to you to end this humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Isn't it time for the Council to hold Israel legally accountable and uh, to punish Israel for the killing, ethnic cleansing, war crimes committed by Israel in Gaza, reminding that these crimes committed as the international community watches are being documented daily by international accountability mechanisms. Isn't it time for the Security Council to shoulder its responsibilities and to respect uh, its principles and the purposes of the UN as set forth in the Charter? Isn't it time for the Council to work uh, to stop uh, the war and aggression and to protect our Palestinian people in Gaza and all the occupied Palestinian territory as well? This is the choice of this Council at a very pivotal point in the history of this organization. Mr. President, the Arab group reaffirms that the just, comprehensive, and lasting peace in accordance with the adopted terms of reference and the Arab Peace Initiative is a strategic Arab choice. The only means for this choice to be implemented is the establishment of an independent Palestinian state that is sovereign with occupied Jerusalem as its capital on the lines of the 4th of June 1967. Mr. President, I would like also to reiterate my thanks to all the member states that voted in favor of the GA resolution that has been a translation of a principled position in the face of double standards in the application of international law and an affirmation to end war, protect civilians in and adhere to legal and humanitarian obligations and in line with the principles and values that this organization was established to uphold and towards the promotion of security and stability and peace in the region and the world. And now, after having concluded this statement on behalf of their group, I would like to say that there are countries that have committed atrocities in countries that they have occupied. But I have never, ever heard that an occupying state the claim to be the victim, to play the victim as Israel is doing now. I thank you, Mr. President. These remarks are in the national capacity. I thank the permanent representative of Jordan for his statement. statement. And uh, the representative, the permanent representative of China has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give the floor to the permanent representative of China. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, the U.S. representative in her earlier statement accused China of vetoing the draft resolution put forward by the U.S. I would like to uh, respond to that. The U.S. representative accused China of vetoing the draft resolutions put forward by U.S. This is the most unreasonable words I have heard today. Put it simply, the United States wants China to be responsible for what's happening in Gaza today. And I have to tell the representative of the U.S. that we are not to blame for this. The U.S. representative should know very well that uh, should know very well how the situation of the Middle East evolved. And the U.S. representative knows the best exactly what the U.S. did in the Middle East. The U.S. representative should also know very clearly that it is the U.S. that has vetoed uh, the draft resolutions of the Security Council on Palestine and Israel, and that led to the difficulty of the Council to play a constructive, responsible role on this issue. And that has led to the Security Council being very difficult to do anything about promoting and implementing the two-state 
uh, solutions. The U.S. representative should also be clear that China, as lo uh, uh, together with many other countries, opposed uh, the U.S. Uh, resolution. The U.S. hastily put forward the resolution after vetoing the uh, resolution put forward by Brazil, by, by Brazil. But the U.S. draft resolution totally disregarded the strong call of the entire world for ceasefire and truce, especially that call from the Arab countries. That confused right and wrong and attempted to take the Palestine-Israel conflict to another narrative, to another path. What is more dangerous is this behavior will uh, give a green light to the further escalation of the situation there. For th that kind of draft resolution, China has all the reasons to uh, uh, vote in opposition to that. Our uh, position on vote on the vote is based on facts, law, conscience, and justice. It's also based on the strong call of the entire world, especially that of the Arab countries. The General Assembly later on adopted that resolution. And in that resolution, send a very clear, unequivocal, uh, unequivocal uh, uh, message for the truce and stopping the fighting and prevention of the humanitarian crisis there. And this has got the a uh, strong and affirmative support of the overwhelming majority of the UN members. This adoption of the GA resolution is another proof that China's position is entirely correct. I hope that the US will earnestly adopt a responsible attitude and work together with members of the Council, focus on the most pressing issues, uh, that is the ceasefire issue in Gaza, that, that is the uh, protection of civilians issue, that is the uh, uh, humanitarian aid, the delivery of humanitarian aid, as well as the prevention of further humanitarian catastrophe. We hope on these pressing issues will consolidate our consensus so that the Security Council will uh, take a more responsible action at an early date. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the permanent representative of China for his statement and the permanent the, the representative of the United States has asked for the floor to make a further statement. I give the perma the representative of the United States the floor. Thank you Mr. <coughs> thank you Mr. President. I, I will be very brief. I just want I, I think as the record shows, uh, China cast a no vote on Wednesday, October 25, on the resolution put forward by the United States. That is a fact. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I thank the representative of the United States uh, for his statement. There are no more names inscribed on the list of speakers. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>